the hotel d'angleterre and other stories by lenoy falconer story one the hotel d'angleterre the hotel d'angleterre is well named for though it stands on the shores of the mediterranean with olive groves and orange gardens all around it nevertheless it is as truly british territory as a london street or a devonshire village the visitors are all english or foreigners with english tastes all of good social standing all orthodox in politics as well as in religion but in spite or perhaps even in consequence of all this the hotel is apt to be a trifle dull such was not the case however during that memorable winter when it was enlivened by the bright presence of miss belinda grant before whom dullness vanished as shade before the sun hers was the sparkle of strong vitality she was never tired or languid or bored or indifferent but always up to the mark if not beyond it and as she was ever ready to employ this overflowing energy in amusing and even directing her fellows she was generally esteemed and beloved especially by that large and supine number who like to have everything even their thinking done for them cole the proprietor heartily approved of a guest who with the charades dances picnics and entertainments of every kind which she organized kept all the other visitors alert and amused while her brilliancy and her beauty were the admiration of the whole german swiss staff with two exceptions the concierge a little man with keenly observant eyes which from his post in the hall he had good opportunities of using and suzanne the chambermaid on belinda's own etage the third the concierge said nothing whilst the others sung the praises of this lovely mise and suzanne irreverently spoke of her as a grande gaillard and of the pleasant stir she made wherever she went as a vacarme but then suzanne was of a moody and even cynical disposition one day belinda and her family were late for the meal which was called either ronge or dejeuner and served at half-past twelve the gong had finished its discordant summons from the various etages the visitors had come trooping down all the places save three were taken and the fresh-faced waiters were handing round the first plat when the grants entered first came mrs grant's slender and drooping figure with her timid and uncertain step behind her advanced belinda with her usual splendid poise and self-possession last of all sauntered in the tired-looking young girl whom every one spoke of as poor little joan have you been for a walk miss grant asked mrs cole the placid mother of a large bevy of rosy-faced damsels who sat opposite to the grants no said belinda with her charming smile i have not been out this morning mamma dear you must have some pilsner joan i insist upon your eating some of this it is good for your headache the fact is mrs cole i have been busy ever since i got up telephoning all over the place for two south rooms and can you not find them dearest miss grant cried miss tucker an elderly lady who was the most fervent of all belinda's admirers no at least not two rooms the hotels are crammed the rooms have all been engaged weeks ago but cole has managed to give me one south room and one that looks west both on our own etage and we must make that do you want them for friends i suppose yes for very old friends of mamma's sir walter and lady montford at this last phrase which belinda pronounced very distinctly indeed something like a thrill seemed to pass through her audience sir walter had been heard of before he belonged to that interesting class the eligibles so poorly represented at oliviera everybody looked pleased except the two bachelors of the hotel old admiral hunt and young mr smith lady montford is a great invalid went on belinda 
she is coming here for the good of her health and her son comes with her to keep her company he must put up with a west room at this time of a year it what is this a telegram it was and from england mrs grant to whom it was addressed opened it with evident trepidation and then with a perplexed look handed it to belinda the message which she did not read aloud was from lady montford and ran thus are drains and water safe after lunch in her mother's room where they generally sat and which belinda had decorated with pictures and knick-knacks she composed an answer as satisfactory as it was terse perfect i suppose they are said mrs grant a little doubtfully when it was read to her of course why should they not be said belinda next day a more puzzling question arrived is climate relaxing or bracing which does she prefer asked belinda and was a little displeased because her mother could not tell her however with great tact she telegraphed back invigorating one more telegram to say she had changed her mind and would not come and then another to say she had changed it again and would completed this prelude to lady montford's arrival i suppose there is some kind of a dower house where she could live when he married said belinda thoughtfully the day the montfords were expected she sat with her mother drinking afternoon tea as all the english loyally did at albiere squeezing it in with some difficulty between the midday dejeuner and a six o'clock dinner mrs grant did not know i wish mamma you occasionally knew something i asked you well you see dear i was only at brookdean once thirty years ago when you and sir walter were both babies i don't think there is the least occasion to remember anything about that no dear certainly of course i beg your pardon what i meant to say was that we were there such a very short time i was sorry for it is a beautiful place such a picturesque house and such fine views but your dear papa and lady montford did not get on well he did not approve of people giving way to illness never having had a day's illness himself he could not bear my not coming down to breakfast even when i was seriously unwell so of course he was rather shocked at lady montford's way of constantly going to bed i mean for quite little things like being tired or sneezing i should think so and pray what did her own husband say to it oh he said nothing but the kindest and most sympathetic things oh what a good husband he was i never met such an unselfish kind-hearted man they say the son is just like him and quite as patient with his mother that is all very well but i hope he is not so patient as to wish to have her in the house after he married because i i mean nobody would be able to put up with that by the by where is joan all this time what has happened to her one of those small things one remembers all one's life had happened to joan she was sitting in the big window of the deserted salon thoroughly enjoying the solitude and the silence and dividing her attention between the book on her knee and the view outside they were both poems beyond the green and gold of the orange trees on the terrace beyond the red roofs of the town below she saw a band of liquid blue vivid as the petal of a forget-me-not dark as a midsummer night above which floated a chain of mountains or rather the ghosts of mountains shaped out of softest violet-coloured vapour it was like a mosaic of jewelled stones on such a radiant afternoon as this was ah yes thought joan shifting a little the heavy volume of shakespeare on her lap the world is quite as beautiful as the poets say but life is very different there is nothing poetical or romantic about that and as to falling in love like the girls always do in plays and stories it is impossible 
the real men are all so commonplace looking hardly had she formed this conclusion when looking up she saw through the window standing between the primulas on the doorsteps a tall fair young man as handsome and even romantic looking as ferdinand himself might have been and yet he wore a tweed suit and a wide-awake hat and carried a bundle of railway wraps joan transfixed with surprise continued to stare at him mechanically repeating to herself with quite a new perception of them the words she had just been reading i might call thee a thing divine for nothing natural i ever saw so noble till suddenly he looked up at her then joan fled startled as if she had seen a ghost so completely and in an instant had her theory of life been overturned it was sir walter montford who had just stepped out of the long omnibus from the station he was thinking of anything but poetry or romance being responsible for the luggage including all the rugs baskets and umbrellas which lady montford herself was too ill and west the maid too bewildered to count yet he saw and noticed with a passing thrill of compassion the little face at the window so wan and so wistful-eyed in the hall which bright colours and gilding and flowers made so gay the dapper herr cole himself received the newcomers and forthwith conducted them to what he called the lift he observed politely as they started that madame and mademoiselle grant waited on the third etage to welcome them how very inconsiderate cried lady montford just when it is so important after all this fatigue that i should not be over-excited if i am not extremely careful i shall have had a bad night and that is a thing i cannot stand west i hope you have the tea-things ready where you can get them at once i have not taken anything for nearly three hours now and i must not allow myself to get low or but at this instant the lift stopped the door opened and in the doorway appeared a tall and beautiful blonde who in ringing accents bade them welcome to oliviera mrs grant too was there but she was very glad to leave belinda to do the honours with her customary grace and animation she introduced lady montford to her south room with a gracious speech none the less fluently delivered because the person to whom it was principally addressed was too busy superintending west's preparations to pay even the semblance of attention well mother said sir walter somewhat disturbed himself by this scene i will leave you because i know you liked to be alone after a long journey you won't come down to table d'hote but we shall meet i hope miss grant they did meet on the staircase as the gong was sounding when behind belinda looking beautifully pink and white in her shimmering black gown crept a young girl most unbecomingly attired whose sweet tired face sir walter instantly recognized my sister joan said belinda carelessly but by no means careless was his acknowledgment of the introduction his manners are as beautiful as himself thought joan sidling shyly away from him and averting her eyes as if from some distasteful object will you sit between mamma and me said belinda the request sounded like a royal one and as such he obeyed it while down the lighted table all eyes turned curiously in his direction meantime a long procession of waiters bearing dishes appeared and dinner began as they worked slowly through it belinda talked on in her easy lively way a good deal about herself she liked lawn tennis riding and all active sports and never knew what it was to be tired she was very fond of reading too though for that she had but little time and delighted in music painting scenery in fact everything beautiful as to travelling she was she said devoted to it and uh, do you enjoy travelling too mrs grant he asked 
at last curious to hear the voice and opinion of some other member of the family mrs grant's delicate white face flushed slightly as after a few moments hesitation she answered timorously that she was too old to appreciate it as much as her daughter mamma enjoys it very much said belinda her own blooming cheek turning a deeper rose and she has improved wonderfully in health since we left home it was on her account i came here i think delicate people should always travel it prevents them thinking too much about themselves besides if one always stays at home one gets so narrow-minded yes but it is very comfortable what staying at home yes and being narrow-minded but before belinda had decided what he could mean everybody rose and they all left the dining-room in the big drawing-room sir walter was introduced to the grants especial friends they were all very gracious to him except admiral hunt who was never gracious to anybody and mr smith who viewed him with pardonable dislike in a field where he had been hitherto without a rival the ladies praised alviera to him and still more ardently lauded dear miss grant she keeps my girls perpetually amused said mrs cole knitting placidly the while in a deep armchair ah she is getting up a round game will you join it sir walter looking carefully around the room and observing that the little pale girl had vanished said he must go and see how his mother was getting on she was not getting on at all the sheets were insufficiently aired there was a dangerous draught from the window with a strange earthy smell in the passage and last but not least her hot milk had not been cooked to the exact temperature which she desired i will see the cook to-morrow mother and tip him and there is another thing walter about which we must come to an understanding i cannot have that woman running in and out of my room all day what woman mother that uh, miss grant the big one with the high colour the little one i do not mind and the mother was always an inoffensive person but if i were to see much of the eldest she would drive me into a fever her voice you know how sensitive i am to voices her voice goes through me like a knife and she presumes to tell me what i had better do and what i had better not do i who have made a study of my health for years ah oh, well the cook i can tackle but i really cannot undertake to suggest to miss grant that any one can have too much of her company very well then i must manage it myself i must just give her a hint miss grant i will say do not trouble to inquire after my health so often for in the present state of my nerves the less i see of all but very intimate friends the better hmm that will certainly be explicit i am afraid you don't appreciate miss belinda grant she is the idol of the hotel they all worship her you don't mean to tell me walter that you admire her how could i help admiring her that was indeed the prevailing impression at the hotel d'angleterre everybody high and low prepared to watch the development of a love affair the servants were divided in opinion as to whether the hero and heroine were already betrothed or no the concierge affirmed that they were not and never would be and suzanne was understood to hope the same out of pity as she declared for an unfortunate young man already sufficiently afflicted by a mother like number eighty seven who ate like an ogre and demanded every hour impossible things meantime belinda with even more than her usual zeal was providing for sir walter's entertainment and a series of picnics filled up the first two or three days of his visit and if the ungracious truth must be confessed considerably bored him one morning strolling out from the salle a manger where he had been eating a substantial english breakfast 
He saw Joan standing at the table where all day long the concierge distributed stamps, change, and advice to the visitors. " You are better to day," he said, as he shook hands with her. Her face was less colourless than usual, her eyes, a little wider open, proved to be blue instead of grey, and her lips, as she answered him, curved into a smile. " Oh, yes, I am quite well. Another stamp, please — for Italy this time. Mamma and I are going to have a nice long afternoon together." " Indeed ! Where ?"" Only here. You know, Belinda and all of you are going to Terraville to see the pottery." " Are we ?"" Yes. Don't you remember ?"" Belinda arranged it last night. Mamma does not go for long drives, and there is no room for me." " And you are in good spirits at getting rid of us all ?" Joan looked a little confused. " No, not at all," she said. Then, as if she felt she were getting into a difficulty, she muttered something about Belinda waiting, and ran off. By the time she had reached the next etage her embarrassment was forgotten, for Sir Walter, standing where she had left him, could hear her humming a little song. When he could hear it no longer he turned away with a slight start, like one who has been dreaming, and then observed the concierge's eyes fixed upon him. When the gong sounded for dejeuner that day the rain was falling heavily. The concierge met Belinda at the foot of the stairs. " You will not require the fiacres this afternoon, I suppose, mees? "" Certainly I shall." " Pardon, mees, I thought perhaps the weather "" And Mrs. Cowell, she said you would not go." " We are going. Send for the fiacres again if you have countermanded them." " Mrs. Cowell," she cried, directly she took her place opposite that lady, " do I hear you want to give up the expedition to Terraville ?"" Well, my dear, I thought perhaps it was so wet you uh, — but what does it matter whether it is wet or dry? The carriages can be shut. I hate stopping indoors all day, and when I make a plan I like to carry it out. Don't you, Sir Walter ?" "Certainly," said Sir Walter, without the faintest notion what she was asking him, having acquired in his mother's company a convenient but dangerous habit of totally ignoring uninteresting talk. Besides, he was wondering where and how Joan intended to spend the afternoon. Belinda prevailed, as she always did, and at half-past two she marshalled her party in the hall and directed them to their places in the fiacres which stood in a row before the doorsteps in the pouring rain. In the last she was to go herself, with two of the younger Cole girls and Sir Walter. The girls had already run giggling down the steps and were waiting for her to follow. But where was he? Coming downstairs, very slowly, without either hat or coat on. Not only Belinda's eyes, but those of all the attendant waiters, rested on him with amazement. But Sir Walter was blissfully unconscious of the emotions he excited. "'Sir Walter!' exclaimed Belinda. "'You are not ready?' "'I?' he answered rather absently. "'Oh, no, I am not going.' Then, strolling up to the doorway, through which the rain and the wind were beating, he added in the same tone, I hope you won't get wet. Belinda, without answering, ran quickly down toward the fiacre, and as it drove slowly off, he turned away toward the drawing-room. What did I tell you? said the concierge, brushing the raindrops from his shoulders. It is certainly wonderful, said the head-waiter, but the English no man can understand. In the great fireplace in the drawing-room, they had lighted a wood fire, which flickered cheerfully. Sir Walter, looking in, saw Mrs. Grant in a deep armchair beside the hearth, the lines of her head and figure suggesting complete and thoroughly enjoyed repose. But she was alone. He went back to the hall and wandered up and down till his watching ear heard a step upon the stairs. He could gaze at Joan intently as she came down the last flight, 
for her eyes anxiously rested on a pyramid of books and boxes which she carried with some difficulty at the foot of the stairs he came forward to help her allow me he said but joan gave a little cry and the upper part of her pyramid fell in a shower around her why i thought you had gone to terraville she said the least touchy mortals are sometimes ruffled by very little allow me to carry these things into the salon for you said sir walter stooping to collect them and then i will keep out of your way as completely as if i had gone to terraville joan gasped and grew crimson as she followed him into the salon where he silently deposited his burden why sir walter exclaimed mrs grant at sight of him in tones of amazement mingled with dismay you have not gone to terraville then no i have not i dislike expeditions of all kinds and i think the terraville pottery hideous still i am very sorry to have caused so much disappointment i don't quite understand how my going should have been taken for granted i am certain i never said i was going he left the room and was turning toward the stairs when joan came quickly after him please forgive me she said pantingly breathless with nervousness i did not mean anything rude you quite misunderstood me the effort tinged her whole face with a delicate pink which in some curious way threw into relief the fine lines of her brows and contour and the violet darkness of her beseeching eyes you see it is belinda said joan in gathering courage a little as his face softened belinda always understood you were going and when people do not do as she expects she does not like it oh and then of course when belinda does not like things she is i mean uh, it, it is not pleasant for mamma don't you see well no i must confess i don't see exactly but it does not matter nothing matters he added with one of those moving changes of tone of which some voices like fine instruments are capable so long as i may understand the sight of me is not hateful to you whereupon the walls of the hall seemed to joan to grow misty and recede after that the afternoon went very happily though mrs grant was visibly dejected joan's shyness for the time at least had disappeared in the excitement of her great effort and sir walter made the most of the opportunity when at last he succeeded in making her laugh his heart bounded within him but his triumph was still greater when as the afternoon wore on and mrs grant fell into a doze joan began to speak about herself the photographs she was now unfolding and gumming into her album were views of dear dear delhurst their english home it was a small and humble home enough to judge by its portraits nor did the surrounding country appear transcendently beautiful but the air is lovely said joan mamma and i always feel so well there of course alviera is a great deal prettier but i am not artistic like belinda and i cannot admire things properly when i always feel tired or have neuralgia as i do here belinda does not care for delhurst and she does not like to see me with those photos some day when she marries mamma and i will go back to delhurst we will make the garden so pretty and i mean to keep some hens as joan unfolded this magnificent programme she looked straight before her with dilated eyes as if she saw across europe and the sea her chickens and her roses and uh, you will invite me to but his words were interrupted by the sound of wheels on the gravel outside and three fiacres drove noisily up to the hall door mrs grant awoke with a kind of guilty start and stood up joan also sprang to her feet and began hastily collecting her treasures belinda's voice and step were heard in the hall and then she entered what here still i thought you would have tea ready by this time 
Mamma, you know I think this salon is too draughty for you. Dear me, what a litter! Pray take it upstairs at once. I hope you have had a pleasant afternoon, said Sir Walter. But Belinda swept from the room without a word. If Belinda's wrath takes the form of silence, thought he, I think I can bear it. Nor was he much dismayed when, coming down late to dinner, he found the order of their places changed and a chair left vacant for him at some distance from the Grants. Without a pang of regret, he heard Belinda chattering most pleasantly to Mr. Smith. All he now wanted was to carry on his interrupted conversation with Joan, and that he intended to do directly after dinner. When it was over he went with all the others to the hall, where the concierge every night distributed the letters which the English mail had brought. There was one for Belinda, and as she opened it he drew near to Joan. But Belinda, without waiting to read her letter, took her sister off to the salon and set her to play in a round game which lasted till bedtime. And so it went on. Mrs. Grant and Joan were never to be seen save in company with Belinda, and her look and the tone of her voice when she answered curtly such remarks as he ventured to make to her seemed to draw round all three an invisible but impassable barrier. Joan, it would seem, could not even look across it for lack either of courage or desire, and her eyes, heavy and wistful, as when he first saw her, were kept steadily averted from him. After three days he began to understand the full disadvantage of displeasing Belinda. At this serious and unexpected hitch there was dismay among all the interested spectators, not excepting the little concierge, to whose private and particular theory it was as fatal as to any one's. The only person who remained wholly unmoved by it was Lady Montford, too absorbed in discovering whether the air of Olviera really suited her or no, to have time to take heed of passing events. One day some friends, Mr. and Mrs. Loscombe, came over from Nice to lunch with Belinda, bringing with them, uninvited, a third guest. At first sight of him Belinda was inclined to be displeased, for he was not only old and ugly, but he was common-looking, and Belinda could not bear anything common. "'Dearest Belinda,' cried Mrs. Loscombe, "'we have taken the greatest liberty. But you are always so kind and sweet, I know you will forgive us for venturing to bring with us a very intimate friend who is staying with us, Lord Denby." Upon which Belinda visibly softened. "'He is such a dear,' Mrs. Loscombe whispered to Belinda, as they went in arm in arm to déjeuner. "'A widower, with no children, very rich, but so shy. We can hardly get him to open his lips. Oh, I can always get on with people like that, said Belinda, and forthwith made good her words, and the day after, in answer to a pressing invitation from the Loscombs, she went off to pay them a visit. The news was broken that same afternoon to Sir Walter by Miss Tucker, who was sitting disconsolate in the salon with a railway guide before her gone just when i wanted her so much to decide for me which route i had better go home by is it not miserable without her lady montford also made mention of belinda's departure but in somewhat different terms ah what a treat it is no she never came into my room but none of these flimsy foreign walls could keep out the sound of her voice it was going all day long in the next room or in the passage. I shall dine downstairs to-day. We seem lost without Miss Grant, don't we? said Mrs. Cole at dinner. Sir Walter did, indeed, look as if he were lost, in thought. A small stringed band, which from time to time visited the hotel, was going to play that night, and under cover of the music, and in Belinda's absence, he hoped to come to some explanation with Joan. 
he came out of the reading room just as the musicians were softly testing their strings before beginning they stood in front of the great centrepiece of statues and ferns where clusters of lamps glowed above the green while all around in the windows and on the stairs the visitors had grouped themselves to listen the scene was bright and picturesque and foreign but sir walter surveyed it all in search of one thing and found it not he leant against the wall just beside the concierge's table and waited and watched while the band played their first piece a brilliant overture mrs grant is not here he said inquiringly to mrs cole as the patter of applause died away no she has a headache she has gone to bed i think mees grant observed the concierge in a low voice and with a tact which sir walter did not at the time sufficiently observe or admire she hears the music from upstairs on the third etage the band was playing again this time quick dance music to which sir walter felt as if his pulses kept time however deliberately his feet may have moved as he went upstairs on the first and second landings waiters maids and couriers hung over the banisters listening to the music but on the third floor there was nobody but joan sitting all by herself on the last step the gay measure had now changed to a slower and a sweeter one and joan heard it in something the same spirit in which ten days ago she had looked upon the flower-like blue of the sea but since then her faith in the possibilities of life had widened she found it easy to believe that fate might match the beauty of the loveliest place and season with rapture as supreme not for her however not for her was such bliss but for the strong and beautiful elect of destiny like and then she saw him coming up toward her he looked royally beautiful of course but a little terrible all the same his manner as he returned her timid good evening was cold almost stern miss grant he said forthwith standing erect and stiff on the step just below her have i offended you in any way uh, offended i murmured joan as if the moth should presume to take umbrage at the star yes so i naturally conclude from your manner for three whole days you have avoided me in the most deliberate the most marked way you would not so much as look at me an unaccountable thrill of pleasure tempered the distress with which she heard these reproaches i, I was not uh, how could i be uh, offended it was belinda who was angry but had i given miss grant any reason to be offended no no of course not then why because she was offended without a cause should you have been so cruel there was a sudden change of key toward the close of this sentence so irresistible was the upward look of the meek and beseeching little face but he was far from guessing how moved joan really was under that tremulous but quiet bearing by a scene which to him was in part a joke to her all grim earnest she answered with little pauses to draw breath between every two or three words mamma wished me not to speak to you if i could possibly help it what have i offended mrs grant oh no n not in the least and mamma likes you very much indeed and yet she forbids you to speak to me only b because if i had spoken to you it, it would have made uh, belinda angry the music below had ceased there was complete silence as sir walter heard and considered this remarkable explanation the domestic situation it suggested was to him simply ludicrous and he knew not with which of the three actors therein to be most impatient his feelings found relief in irony ah oh, if miss grant would be angry that is a different thing 
Of course, anything is better than that. I am sorry I ventured to approach you, and I shall be careful not to do so again. Do you think she would object to my wishing you good-bye? He did not stir, having not the faintest intention of going. But how could Joan know this? She looked not up, but down now, so that he could not see her face. Perhaps she might even allow us to shake hands, since it is an eternal farewell, he went on, and three exquisite opening chords from below punctuated the terrible words. I don't think she would be very angry, he added caressingly, as he sat down on the step beside Joan, the better to perform the ceremony. Then he started violently. The child was crying fast. Ah, well, after that, to use his own words in speaking of it afterward, he was a gone coon. What he exactly intended to do when he came upstairs has never been made plain. What he actually did was to lay himself and all that he possessed at the feet of the little girl he had been taking to task. He caught her in his arms and upbraided himself for having made her weep. He kissed away the tears and besought her to give him the right for evermore to comfort and protect her, while below the violins seemed to reiterate all he said with sobs of almost human passion. But as the music ended with a dying fall, and he too paused and waited for her answer, a hateful footstep rapidly approaching caused them to draw asunder just before Suzanne appeared behind them. Suzanne, whom Sir Walter rose and faced with not the most welcoming expression, did not herself look in the best of humours. "'Madame desires to see you,' she said gruffly. Joan rose, and they both went down the corridor together in silence. Even at Joan's door they could but exchange a cold good night, since Suzanne was still close behind them. "'Pray, are you waiting for anything?' said Sir Walter impatiently. "'Eh, mon Dieu! I am always waiting for something. There is no means of doing otherwise with persons so capricious as those who come here. If monsieur would kindly arrange with madame at what hour in the end they do wish to start in the morning. His mother's door was open, and the maid, laden with things, was running backward and forward between the room and the trunks outside. In the room itself Lady Montford paced up and down, surrounded by that disorder which attends a hasty packing up. "'Walter, where have you been?' she cried at sight of him. We must leave this place by the earliest possible train. Why, what is the matter? From the first moment I stepped out of the train I knew there was something wrong. I said so to you that very night, did I not, West? But one person after another has told me such stories about the place, and so misled me that I hardly like to believe my own senses. And now, by the merest chance, a most providential chance for me, I learn I was perfectly right. Imagine my feelings when I was told to-night that this air I am breathing, and have been breathing for a week now, has not a particle of ozone in it. Oh, and who told you this? That very gentlemanly and intelligent-looking young man who sat next to me at the table d'hôte to-night. Do you mean Mr. Smith? No, indeed. Mr. Smith is an idiot. He assured me the other day when I met him in the garden that the air was bracing. I mean that young dark man who arrived to-day. He told me a very clever doctor had assured him there was no ozone in the air of Alviera until you got, I forget how many thousands of feet above the level of the sea far above this hotel in any case ah well perhaps for a short time it does not matter does not matter my dear walter how wildly you talk it is simply death to me to live in a place without ozone dr blind himself has often said to me whatever you have or don't have lady monford you must have ozone and then sends me here 
well the only possible train to paris leaves at midday to-morrow i can't exist here till then let us go the other way to genoa by the early train mrs grant was talking of the other day to genoa are you sure there is any ozone there oh yes he said there was who dr blind no indeed no more of dr blind for me after this the young man i spoke of assured me the air there is excellent we can go home by turin and the mount Cenis. sir walter silently contemplated his mother as flight was inevitable genoa was he concluded the best place to retreat to since it possessed at least the signal merit of being but a day's journey from the hotel d'angleterre if only he might have seen joan before he went he suggested that suzanne should carry forthwith a message to miss grant which he was anxious she should have but suzanne protested that the young lady and her mother were by this time in bed and asleep being rational persons who at so late an hour remained tranquil and allowed others to do the same she consented however to convey betimes next day to joan a note in which sir walter explained what had happened and entreated joan to see him before he started for genoa or to let him know in some way that he was as happy as he hoped the fee that accompanied this missive softened even suzanne i gave your note to the demoiselle without fault she observed to him as he came out of his room next day in the early dawn its sad twilight together with an unusual and depressing silence rested over all the corridors as he went down with his mother to breakfast by candlelight it was a cheerless repast lady montford was afraid the tea had stood too long and sir walter was not less troubled concerning a different matter why did joan give no sign at last the bundles and trunks having all been carried out and the servants duly feed there seemed no excuse for further delay so they went forth into the clear cold air of a rosy morning but just as sir walter was about to follow his mother into the omnibus the concierge came tearing down the steps with a note in his hand for monsieur another bill cried lady montford how provoking never mind we can send them the money from genoa but it did not take two minutes to read please forgive me wrote joan in a villainous hand for misleading you last night it was all a mistake i cannot be your wife go on cried sir walter crushing the note up into his hand as he sprang into his place au revoir monsieur et madame cried the concierge god forbid exclaimed lady montford it has nearly been the death of me and of you too my dear walter i never saw you look so ill as you do now mrs grant alone in her room that afternoon was more than usually miserable she had only been doing as she had done for years sacrificing the child she loved to the child she feared but perhaps because that day the victim's sufferings were more evident her torpid conscience was uncomfortably roused joan was prostrated in her room with what she called a headache and her mother suspected with anguish to be something worse as she prepared afternoon tea of which she intended to carry joan a cup the scene in her room the night before constantly recurred to her she saw joan as she first entered radiant transfigured beautified even by joy then joan as she crept away again all faded and drooping mrs grant writhed when she thought of it and yet joan had confessed after a hesitation in itself preposterous that she did not know whether she was in love with sir walter or not adding in her strange way that he was too far above her for that perhaps this was the extravagant language of real passion seeing that now the child seemed so heartbroken and yet what could i do what could i do mrs grant wailed inwardly repeating the great motto of her life belinda would have been so angry i never should have dared to tell her 
the door opened and belinda entered mrs grant dropped the little china teapot on the stone hearth and broke it well really mamma you have as the boys say butterfingers said belinda but with less severe displeasure than clumsiness usually provoked from her my dear you startled me so i thought you were at nice i had no idea you were coming home to-day nor i said belinda taking her hat off before the glass and arranging her shining curls never mind about the pieces mamma you have another teapot on the shelf there she was evidently in high good humour and as she always did when in this sunny mood looked superbly handsome the fact is she began taking her place in a low chair by the wood fire that uh, but where is joan she is lying down she has a headache a very bad headache added mrs grant for belinda highly disapproved of people lying down in the daytime even in her present indulgent temper she looked displeased what has she been doing she was all right when i left it is a strange thing that if i ever do go from home joan makes herself ill in some way have you been allowing her to stoop over books too much oh no dear she has been reading very little for her then she has been over walking herself no then why has she a headache when belinda asked questions in this tone mrs grant had not the courage to keep silence especially if there was anything she particularly wished to conceal from her daughter perhaps she suggested desperately the montford's sudden going may have put her out they have gone have they mamma surely that tea is ready to pour out but why should the montford's going suddenly or not make any difference to joan mrs grant had by this time been driven or to speak more correctly had herself wildly rushed into a corner from which a more self-possessed person might have found it difficult to escape as it was she did not try but trembling confessed what had happened i assure you belinda she concluded i never was so taken aback in all my life as when she told me he had proposed for her i should think not and what did you say oh i told her of course said mrs grant visibly cheering up at the thought that at last she had something agreeable to tell belinda i told her of course that it could never be what could never be why their marriage do you mean to tell me said belinda slowly putting down her cup and saucer and gazing as if dazed at her mother that you told her to refuse him well, yes of course in heaven's name why why because i i thought belinda said mrs grant dissolving into tears i thought you would not like the marriage then belinda rose to her feet her eyes blazing her cheeks crimson her breath shortened with indignation in all her life mrs grant had never seen her daughter so angry what she cried in a voice that might have filled a theatre and with a gesture which would have electrified her audience what do you mean what do you intend to insinuate really mamma you are enough to drive one crazy here is joan who with her wretched looks and manners could hardly be expected to have ever got an offer at all is proposed to by a man with a title and a very nice place and you actually tell her to refuse him and then dare to put the blame on me i would not like the marriage indeed pray why not as if i ever wished to stand in joan's way just as if instead of looking after her health and her interests and everything else in a way you never do i was cruel to her or perhaps even jealous of her a nice idea you must give people of me i have no doubt you told joan i would not like it and she of course will go complaining and repeating all about it to everybody well one thing thank goodness they cannot say they cannot say i am envious of her good luck because i am going to make a much better marriage myself yes i was going to tell you if you had not flown at me in this way 
that I was engaged to Lord Denby, engaged only this morning, and that is another thing. Pray, what is to become of Joan? Lord Denby, being a very generous man, might not object to have you live with him, but I cannot expect him to adopt my whole family. This was by no means all that Belinda said, but it contains the sum and substance of her discourse. The rest consisted of variations on the original theme. But there is no good talking, she said, with great wisdom, at the close of a kind of hysterical attack into which she had worked herself, something must be done. And you must do it, Mamma. You have got us into this scrape, and you must get us out of it. Oh! What can I do? There is only one thing to be done you must write to Sir Walter at once. The concierge will know his address. You must write and say that it was entirely your fault that Joan refused him, and that she is really very much attached to him. Mind you make that clear, or he won't come back. His touchiness and conceit are beyond anything. But, Belinda, what reason can I give for forbidding Joan to accept him? You can't give any you know quite well there was none. Oh, what will he think of me? I am sure I don't know, but he shall not think I am jealous of his proposing to Joan. Now, mamma, here is pen, ink, and paper. Don't sit crying there in that silly way. You know you have behaved very unkindly to poor Joan, and the least you can do is to make amends for it as quickly as possible." Thus swiftly overtaken by Nemesis did poor Mrs. Grant, with tears of mortification, indite the letter Belinda dictated, and which the writer, for one, would give much to have seen. Unfortunately, it is lost to the world. On his journey back from Genoa, confused either by excess of joy or deficiency of ozone, Sir Walter dropped, mislaid, in any case, lost this remarkable document, and when, some years later, his mother-in-law took courage to ask him what he thought of it and of her when he read it, all that he could remember was that a more delightful letter he had never received. Yes, the marriage has been a very happy one, though Lady Montford did not retire to the dower house, built, so she declares, upon a clay foundation, and Lady Denby has every reason to be satisfied with a match which, as she often observes, and not without some reason, she made for her sister at the Hôtel d'Angleterre. End of Story 1 Story 2 the violin obligato though there was no one at home at the old grange inhabitants of the newer houses round leicester driving as they were permitted to do through its thickly wooded park heard sounds of music issuing from the open windows it was sylvia clanover practising her violin lady clanover had more than one orphan granddaughter to introduce to society her plan was to take them all in turn. Sylvia's, though she was past eighteen, had not yet come. Her governess was gone, but she was still in the schoolroom, and whilst her grandmother chaperoned an elder cousin through a London season, passed the summer in solitude. Mrs. Vane, the dean's wife, bethought herself of this lonely musician when the amateur concert in aid of the new reading-room was at hand, and the beautiful Jessica Graham protested that she could not sing her duet with Mr. Paul Seymour to no more inspiring accompaniment than Mrs. Graham's on the piano. I wish we could have the violin obligato, for Mamma always plays straight on one two three as if she were playing to a metronome it would be such a help to have something a little more sympathetic then mrs vane went up to the grange and used her influence as an old friend of the clanovers to bring sylvia and her violin to a rehearsal of the duet which was to take place in mrs graham's drawing-room Sylvia Clanover was a fine-skinned, brown-eyed little creature, with a childlike simplicity of manner. The violin part she had studied already. 
She now asked to look at the song, and attentively considered both music and words. The latter ran something like this: "Where summer clouds are sailing Above a sunlit sea, A voice is heard bewailing The winter that shall be. How sad this ceaseless sigh For beauty born to die, And that high bliss of noon Which night enshrouds too soon!" And the refrain went: "O sweet our faith shall hold one fort Untaken in this eternal triumph of decay, For we shall breast the storm of time unshaken, And love to morrow as we love to day." "The sentiment, of course, is a little high flown," said Mrs. Vane apologetically, and was then somewhat perplexed by the evident astonishment in Sylvia's eyes, which indeed expressed much the same amazement as Mrs. Vane herself might have felt if some one in her presence had spoken of the Apostles' Creed as high flown. "'Would they sing it now?' suggested Sylvia timidly. She was a little shy of these strangers, and a good deal dazzled by the colour and glitter of a room furnished and bedizened according to the latest fashion, but all trace of embarrassment vanished as she tuned her violin, and then, taking her place by the violin stand, just opposite the singers, and the wide-open door window behind them, stood ready to play, but not yet playing, listening and looking jessica glancing upward from the sheet before her saw the earnest eyes dilate and darken and gleam as if reflecting some newly kindled flame it was a wonderful moment in sylvia's experience which had hitherto been remarkably prosaic in poems and paintings but never in real life had she seen anything like the picture now before her paul seymour pale, dark-eyed, and slender, might have posed for Romeo himself, while Jessica, to whom some Spanish ancestors had bequeathed her almond-hued complexion and wonderful dark eyes, with such a figure as ripens usually only under a tropical sun, she might have been the heroine of any tale of passion or romance, till she spoke, and her lips curved almost involuntarily into a smile half sweet half playful which was more winsome than her beauty and this most picturesque pair stood side by side singing from the same page the eulogy of constant love against a background which the summer had prepared for them of flaming scarlet flowers dewy green foliage and cloudless june sky no wonder that sylvia surpassed herself and surprised her hearers by her playing which seemed at once to throw an artistic grace over what had been hitherto a rather commonplace performance it was as if she had discovered in the music and now disclosed to others an alternate pathos and triumph which nobody had suspected the singers both of sensitive temperaments answered quickly to her touch they sang as they had never sung before, till at the close, where Jessica's ringing soprano and Paul's weak but sympathetic tenor rang forth together in the lines, For we shall breast the storm of time unshaken, and love to-morrow as we love to-day. With the voice of the violin soaring and quivering above them, the effect was such that Mrs. Vane, as she afterward explained, felt a cold shiver run down her back my dear sylvia she then exclaimed that is exquisite and jessica was quite right the addition of the violin is the very greatest improvement is it not dear mrs graham yes said the plump matron at the piano looking kindly round upon the performers all slightly flushed with the consciousness of success it is always a good plan to have more than one instrument to accompany amateurs as it all helps to hide when they sing out of tune the duet was declared to be the gem of the concert colonel graham who there being no race meeting that week happened to be at home was among the audience and highly delighted at his daughter's triumph he heartily acknowledged sylvia's contribution thereto when the concert was over and in the warmth of his gratitude insisting that she should go home in his carriage instead of bringing out the dean's averring with more courtesy than accuracy that the grange lay very little out of their own way 
Yes, do come," urged Jessica, with a look and a touch that made Sylvia flush all over with delight. " I want to know you better." " Yes," said Colonel Graham, presently, as they drove along through the darkness, " there was nothing to compare with that duet in the whole pro gramme. Miss Llanover, your playing is superb, and as to you, my darling, though perhaps I ought not to say so, I never heard even a professional sing better. The only pity is that you had no one but young Seymour to sing with. If you had had a real tenor "" Mr. Seymour's is a real tenor, papa." " Rubbish ! it's no more a tenor than your own." " Excuse me, papa, it is, and everybody con siders it so." " Not anybody who knows anything about music." " Yes, papa, the very best judges of music in the place." " There aren't any." " Do you mean to say Mrs. Vane and Mr. Parsons are not good judges of music ?"" Not if they say young Seymour's voice is a tenor." " I am afraid you are not much of a judge yourself, papa." " How dare you speak to me like that I who, before you were born, was singing myself with some of the first musicians in Europe ?" On they went, the Colonel's voice getting louder and louder, and Jessica, in order to be heard, compelled to shout also, till Sylvia, in whose household nobody ever spoke above a nice drawing-room pitch, trembled with agitation. Mrs. Graham, beside whom she sat, took no part in the discussion, but when it was at its height, with great difficulty, secured a hearing. "'What is it?' cried her husband, turning fiercely upon her. Is the West Road the right way to the Grange? Of course it isn't, because Short has just turned down that way." Upon which the Colonel threw himself half out of the window, and in forcible language discharged upon the coachman the remainder of his wrath, for the musical contest was not afterward resumed. "'I will come over and see you to-morrow, if I may,' were Jessica's parting words and she came, driving two fiery chestnuts before her, and looking, so it seemed to Sylvia, like a daughter of the gods to whom Apollo might have confided his chariot. As all the reception-rooms were dismantled, it was to her own especial sitting-room, the old schoolroom, that Sylvia led her new friend. It seemed sadly bare and dull to Jessica, who felt she could not have lived two days in a place so unadorned, and even the big bow-window looked out upon greensward and trees with neither flower-bed nor border. Of books there were plenty, and music in heaps about the cottage piano. "'You play the piano, too. Let me sing something to your playing,' said Jessica, hunting for a song that she knew. I feel as if I could sing twice as well when you accompany me. Please put yourself where I can see you, said Sylvia, as she took her place at the piano, and her look and voice stirred even Jessica, fed to satiety with admiration. You dear little thing, she cried at the end, do you know you have quite won my heart, I who as a rule never can get on with girls. Let us be great friends. She came toward the piano as she spoke, and, smiling, offered her hand, but instead of taking it Sylvia sat looking at her with grave and startled eyes. "'Why!' exclaimed Jessica, more amazed than piqued, "'don't you like me, then?' "'Like you!' repeated Sylvia, with an almost indescribable accent. "'But a friend, a real friend, is such a great thing, and I am not affectionate.' not affectionate no so i should think no indeed i am not affectionate i do not care very much for many people in all my life i have only had one real friend would you like to see his portrait his too jessica was interested and was willingly conducted across the wide hall up the broad stone staircase and along a corridor floored with slippery oak to Sylvia's bedroom. It was just over the schoolroom, and even more scantily furnished, with a huge four-poster bed in the centre, draped with quaintly embroidered but faded tapestry. 
Near this, over a little table on which lay well worn copies of the Bible and Shakespeare, there hung, with a cup of flowers beneath it and a trail of ivy round it, as if it had been some sacred image, a photograph which had already turned dim and yellow, the portrait of a man neither young nor handsome. "'Oh, who is this?' asked Jessica, disappointed. "'It is Uncle Max,' answered Sylvia, in a hushed voice. "'Oh, your uncle, a relation for your friend. How strange!' is that strange i had neither father nor mother i mean they died when i was quite a baby and when i came here uncle max was very kind to me as i grew older he had me a great deal with him and called me his little friend once when i was ill uncle max nursed me they thought i would die but i lived and uncle max died two years afterward when was that asked jessica speaking very softly in response to the look upon sylvia's face it was ten years ago ten years why you can hardly remember him can you remember him i am not sure when i do not see this picture for some time i can't quite remember his face but himself it's just the same as if he had not died i know he is living somewhere sometimes i feel him close to me here ah cried jessica starting with eerie horror but sylvia she added coaxingly drawing the girl toward the open window to which the outer world lifted up its freshness and fragrance do not think of these sad things you are going to be my friend are you not they stood hand in hand silently confronting each other for a little time jessica almost magnetized by the steady gaze of the deep dark eyes into which she looked then sylvia drew a long breath and putting her arms round jessica's beautiful pliant form said more solemnly than caressingly yes i will be your friend why this is as bad as a marriage laughed jessica very glad to shake off with a jest the strange impression by which her susceptible nature was overpowered next day as agreed sylvia returned the visit fancy said jessica complacently our concert has paid better than any ever given here they have made exactly seven pounds pure profit you know seven pounds said mrs graham looking up from some drab-coloured socks she was knitting and it cost a great deal of trouble you've all been working for weeks and now mrs morton and miss peake are laid up with violent colds from coming out into the night air after singing and the vernons and the hardings are not on speaking terms because of that dispute about the first part in the concerted piece how much better it would have been if each of the performers let me see yes there were just fifteen of them had each given ten shillings mamma has such a horribly matter-of-fact way of looking at things complained jessica to sylvia later on as they were sitting in the pink and white nest half boudoir half dressing-room which jessica called her own though papa is so hot-tempered and so obstinate poor old darling when he takes an idea into his head i get on better with him than mamma for though she is never cross she is so unsympathetic then the doorbell rang ah visitors visitors cried jessica rising with a pretty gesture of impatience the house indeed was daily beset with them young men and maidens especially young men some from the close more from the garrison who came to play lawn tennis and drink afternoon tea and hover moth-like about jessica sylvia though a little dazed by the crowd and its wild spirits and instinctively retreating from it to mrs graham's side and shelter could not but approve of the homage to jessica paul seymour who was present recognized sylvia and won her heart by his compliment delivered with evident feeling you play well indeed you are worthy to accompany miss graham then he moved away to the lawn 
not to play tennis, but to watch Jessica acquitting herself in the game with equal dexterity and grace. Mrs. Graham, looking after him thoughtfully, said, "'It seems a pity he should have to go to Egypt.' "'Must he go?' well his cousin who is a governor or something there has promised him some place there and of course it would be foolish to refuse it as he has no money of his own and it is so difficult to find work for young men now but i should think a hot climate would not be good for his liver which must be delicate he always looks so melancholy poor young man he is quite harmless Colonel Graham is prejudiced against him because he writes poetry, but I can't see that it is any worse than drinking or gambling or the other silly things young men will do, and I dare say he will grow out of it. A few days after this, Sylvia came to lunch and practice with Jessica. She found no one in the drawing-room, so she strolled through the window door into the garden, in whose glowing colours her eyes delighted she went past the long bed where the tropiolums flamed in a circlet of bright blue lobelia down a long gravel path bordered by rose trees to where beyond the tennis lawn close growing hollies threw a welcome shade and here as the way took a sharp turn she suddenly came upon paul and jessica he clasping both her hands in his and stooping forward to read her face, which she had half turned from him. But even as Sylvia halted, transfixed by surprise, Jessica moved and lifted her eyes to Paul with one of those looks which, like fine music, put the eloquence of mere words to shame, and as he caught her to him with a murmur of inarticulate delight, Sylvia, conscience-stricken at having seen so much, returned hastily to the house. There, in the drawing-room, she sat with her heart bounding and her brain in a whirl, while Mrs. Graham explained to her the difficulty of having things properly served in a house where people were so unpunctual at meal-times. The practicing after lunch did not go very well. Jessica was unmistakably inattentive and at last tossing the music she held impatiently from her she said sylvia i have something to tell you i think i know what it is oh jessica how then sylvia's voice failed and she fell upon her friend's neck and kissed her passionately after that paul came in and before the stream of visitors began to follow they sang the duet once more Sylvia saw their faces in the same brilliant setting of sunlight and flowers. They looked into each other's eyes when they sang the words, For we shall breast the storm of time unshaken, and love to-morrow as we love to-day. And between the heartbeats of their own delight the violin seemed to throb with a sympathy of which the passion was greater than their own. Sylvia could not sleep till late that night, but sat at her open window gazing into the darkness above the shadowy masses of the great trees a few stars sparkled the air was warm windless heavy with scent from the lime blossoms the unspeakable beauty of the summer night had a new meaning now that it appeared to her as the frame to a joy so solemn and so lovely I suppose Jessica has told you about this foolish business with young Mr. Seymour, was Mrs. Graham's opening comment next day. I think it is quite the silliest freak Jessica has ever had, and one which the Colonel, who is so indulgent to her in most things, will not put up with for a moment. Will he object to their engagement? Of course he will, my dear. An engagement is always a most unpleasant and inconvenient thing in a house. Still, if it is to end in a marriage, one feels bound to put up with it, as young people must, of course, be settled in life. But an engagement which never can come to anything is really too much. But why should not Jessica marry Mr. Seymour? 
" How could she, my dear ? Mr. Seymour has not a penny, and Jessica will not have enough to pay her own expenses. Jessica must marry a rich man. She has such extravagant tastes, and always has had everything she wanted." " They little know me," cried Jessica, when this speech was, at her own request, repeated to her. " There is no one who cares less for money than I do." She stood dressed for the Lord Lieutenant's garden party in a wonderful Parisian gown all of snow white lace and ribbons, and swung impatiently backward and forward as she spoke a long glove delicately perfumed. " What is the good of expensive things ?" she went on, gazing contemptuously round the drawing room she had herself tricked out so prettily. " They do not make one really happy. Love and sympathy, dear Sylvia, are the only things worth living for." Sylvia said " Amen " from her heart, and thought she had never seen Jessica so beautiful as with that look of noble disdain upon her face. Four or five days passed, and Sylvia, receiving no message from Jessica, hesitated to visit the Grahams again, lest she should obtrude upon the lovers. But she was happier than she had ever been in her loneliness, for now, besides her books and her music, she had a living joy over which she brooded, with feelings curiously compounded, of the delight of an art-lover in a new-found treasure, and of a mother's in her suckling child. But on the fifth day the key suddenly changed, and Sylvia, hurrying over in answer to an agitated note from Jessica, found her pacing in stormy sorrow the gay little room which seems prepared for only happy scenes and faces. Colonel Graham, on his return the day before, had received the news of the engagement as his wife had predicted. He had forbidden Paul to set foot in the house, and Jessica to leave it without her mother, lest she should meet or communicate with him. If I could only get a message sent to him in some way, I dare not trust the servants. Give it to me, then, said Sylvia. She had intended to post it, but that was not necessary, for on her homeward way she found Paul waiting to meet her and learn how Jessica was. He received the note with such rapture as satisfied even Sylvia, and met her next day on her road to Beechcroft with an answering letter to Jessica. In this guileless mode was the correspondence conducted for a few days when it came to Colonel Graham's knowledge. His view of the matter was explained to Sylvia by Mrs. Graham, with her usual gentle placidity. You see, the Colonel cannot speak about anything which annoys him without shouting and stamping about the room, which is rather confusing to a stranger. So I thought I had better see you instead, and explain that he is not pleased at your carrying notes between Jessica and Mr. Seymour. And, indeed, my dear, it is not a very wise thing for you to do on your own account as if you are seen meeting mr seymour every day and exchanging notes with him people may talk about it i don't care the least about that but i don't think your grandmother would like it and to tell you the truth the colonel says that unless you promise not to carry any more of these messages he must ask you not to come here any more jessica must decide what i shall do Oh, promise anything rather than not come here, cried Jessica, bursting into tears when she was appealed to. What should I do without you? Sylvia had then to break to Paul this doleful treaty. His gaze of despair went through her heart like a knife, and left it smarting all that day and half the night as well. The days went on and brought no comfort. Jessica grew paler and more listless, exhausted partly by fretting, partly by continual and angry arguments with her father. "'It wears me out, it wears me out!' she cried once, so that at times I feel I must give way. "'Ah, that would be impossible,' said Sylvia. "'You could not give way without being false to Paul.' "'Dear, dear Paul,' said Jessica, taking up a photograph of her lovers and studying it with an exquisite smile. 
No, I should never be false to him. Ah, how I love him, Sylvia ! I have fancied I cared for other men sometimes, but nothing, nothing like what I feel for him." But there came a time when the sight of his picture was not enough. " I can bear it no longer," she cried wildly. " Not to see him is bad enough, but never to hear from him or be able to send him the slightest message. It is almost as if he were dead. Oh, Sylvia, you must help me." She paused before her friend, a beautiful image of grief. They were in the rose coloured dressing room, and she wore a long white wrapper which twined about her lithe form in folds a sculptor might have copied, while round her pale, passionate face her hair, ruffled by the pillows on which she had been resting her head, floated in a soft, dark haze. " What can I do, darling Jessica? I have promised not to carry notes between you." " But you have only promised papa." who, you must allow, is treating me cruelly. I think his conduct is quite fiendish. But still, dearest Jessica, you know I could not break my word." This was the saddest episode this melancholy idyll had yet unfolded. Jessica was disappointed with her friend, and Sylvia felt compelled to behave almost brutally. At last she devised a plan to which Jessica consented, because, as she afterwards said, she did not thoroughly understand it. Sylvia went down to the drawing-room, and candidly explained that she must withdraw her promise, as she now intended to help Paul and Jessica to correspond. "'Dear me!' said Mrs. Graham, who, fortunately, was the only person present. And so I am afraid, Mrs. Graham, that I must not come here any more. No, I am afraid not, my dear. It is a pity. What trouble Jessica is causing by all this nonsense, to be sure. I think it is Colonel Graham who is to blame. So he is, for as I have told him over and over again, if he did not oppose Jessica and go on arguing with her about Mr. Seymour, she would soon be sick of him herself, and we should hear no more about the matter. Sylvia went home and wrote to Paul to explain that the correspondence was to be resumed, and that he would find Jessica's letters and might leave his own in the hollow of a yew tree to one corner of the Beechcroft grounds, separated from a lane by a wall low enough to be easily surmounted. Then, her chief occupation being gone, she began to discover how the last two or three weeks had exhausted her. She felt too tired to practice or to study, or even to improvise on her violin in musical daydreams as of old. She wandered about the park aimlessly, or sat for hours at the open bay window in the schoolroom, gazing into the sunlit green of a resplendent summer, and thinking of the friend she could no longer serve. But this was not to last long. One morning she received a letter from Paul to say that the fatal hour had sounded. In other words, he had been summoned to Egypt, and must leave in two days. Would Miss Clanover, who had always been so constant and sympathetic a friend, and whose powers of persuasion were so great, entreat Colonel and Mrs. Graham to grant him an interview with Jessica before he started? Accordingly, in such a mood as would have carried her unflinchingly into a lion's den, Sylvia presented herself at Beechcroft before the Colonel, as well as Mrs. Graham, to make this astonishing demand. At first only sound and fury followed, as the colonel, walking up and down the room, denounced loudly and in the strongest terms the folly of Jessica, the insolence of Paul, and the impertinence of outsiders who ventured to meddle in his domestic affairs. Sylvia, comprehending a signal from Mrs. Graham, sat mute and motionless the while. At last, when the colonel's fury was partly, and his breath for the moment wholly, spent, Mrs. Graham observed, I cannot see myself any objection to their meeting. 
Then ensued more raging. " It can do no harm," continued Mrs. Graham, at the next lull, " as they are not likely to see each other again." Sylvia bit her lip as if in pain, and the Colonel angrily objected that Seymour unfortunately was not going for life, and would be home again in a few years. " But by that time Jessica will be married, or, if not, she will have certainly forgotten all about him." After that the storm gradually subsided, and a very ungracious consent was obtained. " But I won't have them writing to each other," roared the Colonel. " No correspondence, mind !"" They will correspond, whatever you say, my dear. You cannot prevent it. But it will not be for long, as Jessica, luckily, cannot bear letter writing." " And now there is to be an end to this confounded folly. I suppose Miss Llanover can come here again," said the Colonel, departing, with a sudden softening of the heart, toward his old favourite. " I hope so, indeed," said his wife. " My dear, I am quite concerned to see you look so ill. You take all this a great deal too seriously. Why, in a week or two, Jessica and Mr. Seymour will have forgotten all about it, and be as happy as possible." But this kind of consolation was more distasteful to Sylvia than the Colonel's raging. When Sylvia drove over to Beechcroft next day, she found a fly laden with luggage waiting before the hall door, and as she alighted from the carriage, Paul came hurrying out. He pressed her hand before he sprang into the fly, but spoke not a word, even of farewell. But for weeks afterward, when she was wakeful or feverish at night, his face as it looked then would rise before her, painted on the darkness, and make her wince again. In the drawing-room she found Jessica lying on the floor, with her head resting on the sofa, crying as Sylvia had never heard her cry before, with long sobs more piteous than moaning. Sylvia, sitting down on the floor beside her, silently drew the beautiful head to her shoulder, and there held it close pressed to her cheek, as mothers often hold the babe they comfort. Meanwhile, through the open door window, she looked into the sunlit garden, where the birds were singing and the butterflies flittering, and the flowers glowing jewel-wise in the radiant summer day and felt she had passed into the shadow from which nature holds aloof. But Jessica grew calmer by degrees, and began to speak about Paul's grief and her own. Oh, our time together was so short! He does not sail till to-morrow night, but he must spend to-night at Thornbury, between here and Southampton, with his uncle, the uncle who helped to get him this appointment so he had to hurry off before i had time to say half i wanted to and ah my lock of hair she started up in sudden dismay and drew from her bosom a tiny parcel folded in silver paper i cut it off on purpose for him and now i have forgotten to give it him and he forgot to remind me oh how miserable he will be when he remembers it now he has no keepsake of mine poor darling what time does his train go cried sylvia running to look at the clock perhaps i shall have time to catch him before it starts oh you darling you might just catch him perhaps if you took the short way to the station across the fields from our back gate i will show you they were both in the garden now running together down the gravel path jessica have you any money if i miss him after all i could follow him by the next train oh you little angel would you here is my purse straight on along this path till you come to the road again then to your right and you will soon see the station good-bye you darling little thing oh get it to him somehow he shall have it sylvia called over her shoulder but when she reached the station, Paul's train had started, and the next did not leave for two hours, during which time she underwent that peine forte et dure of which railway stations are too often the scene. 
She might have profitably spent some minutes in eating, for it was past two and she had had no lunch, but she was too ignorant and too shy to find her way to the refreshment room, having always hitherto journeyed in royal fashion with attendants who did everything for her. A porter took her ticket and found a place for her, and about five she reached Thornbury Station. There she learned that Mr. Seymour's place lay nearly six miles from the station, and, at the station-master's suggestion, taking an open wagonette which chanced to be waiting, she drove on thither across a high and bleak down-country. Meantime heavy grey clouds were drawing over the bright sky, and a chill wind from the west blew fitfully. Sylvia, in a cotton gown which had been warm enough when she started, shivered a little as, emerging from a beech avenue, the wagonette drew up before the portico of a big house. To her unspeakable relief, Paul was declared to be within, and presently came out to speak with her. Though at first amazed to see her, he was afterwards so transported with joy at sight of the precious token which she brought him that he could think of nothing else. He was still standing in a kind of ecstasy on the doorsteps as they drove off, and only some minutes later, when the rain was falling heavily, did it occur to him that Sylvia appeared to have neither wrap nor umbrella with her. To Sylvia herself, who would have gone through fire, much less water, on behoof of her friends in their affliction, the rain seemed of little consequence, seeing the main point was now secured but even her sense of relief could not prevent her feeling chilled to the bone in her dripping garments when she reached the tiny station where neither food nor fire was to be found. At Seachester she had wits enough left, faint and dizzy though she was, to order a fly and finally arrived at the Grange, so weary that she could hardly climb the long stairs to her bedroom or swallow the hot milk which the frightened women servants entreated her to take. After this she was in bed for three weeks. And it was all so unnecessary, cried Mrs. Graham, when she heard the whole story, for the hare might have gone just as well by post. He would have had it next morning, which would have been quite time enough. It was not a thing he wanted that very night, like his toothbrush or his night-dress. Both she and Jessica visited Sylvia daily, the one lavishing beef-tea and jellies, the other grateful and caressing words. She was better before her grandmother returned, and that lady, during her short stay previous to a campaign of country-house visits, did not inquire very minutely into the origin of her granddaughter's cold, but departed, adjuring her to be less reckless in the matter of warm clothing and umbrellas. The day of that unlucky journey had been the farewell of summer, after which followed weeks of rain and storm, and Sylvia, still white and weak, was forbidden to go out save on dry days. The dreary time was brightened for her by the twofold pleasure of receiving Paul's letters and transmitting them to Jessica. Jessica, as her eyes grew wet over the first, half offered to let the bearer read it too, but Sylvia recoiled from such a deed as sacrilegious. One day, late in August, when the rain-clouds had parted for a little, and the sun was blazing on the wet sward and foliage, Jessica came over looking less listless and dejected than she had done for many a day. She was going away with her parents to pay a round of visits. They would not be back for six weeks. "'I am sorry to leave you, my darling little Sylvia,' she said, as they sat together in the deep window-seat, "'but I am thankful to get away from Beechcroft. I only wish I was never going to see it again. I hate the very sight of the place where I have been so miserable. You must give me your address as you go from place to place, that I may send you Paul's letters. Will you send me yours to forward still?' no dear that will be more easily managed when we are away from home papa cannot go poking into the post-bag in other people's houses darling paul sylvia do you know though it is nearly four weeks since he left i feel just as devoted to him as ever 
I assure you, come what may, I never, never can care for any other man." " Dear Jessica, could I think so for a moment ? But, oh dear, how hopeless it all seems at times," said Jessica, rising and strolling toward the piano. There, standing, she let her fingers drop upon the keys, and began playing, absently, the chords of the duet. Toward the close she sang very softly, " For we shall breast the storm of time unshaken, and love to-morrow as we love to-day." Sylvia, with her eyes closed and her head thrown back against the window-sill, bet her nether lip to keep it from trembling. It was not only Jessica's voice she heard, Paul's tender tenor mingled with it and the cry of her own violin. She felt the warm air of June upon her face, she saw the green garden vista and the scarlet and azure flowers, and before all and above all the two young faces alight with the rapture of first love. "'Ah, me!' said Jessica, as she turned from the piano and began to pull on her gloves. "'I sometimes think that Paul and I will never sing that song together again.' "'Oh, don't, Jessica!' cried Sylvia, putting out her hand as if to ward off something. "'That never again is such a terrible word. I cannot bear it.' Mrs. Graham also came over to say good-bye to Sylvia, and to give her excellent advice concerning tonics and milk. "'Dear, dear, how ill you do look! This love affair of Jessica's has nearly been the death of you. I do trust you will forget all about it now, as I assure you Jessica will, directly she has something fresh to think about.' and now the weather became brighter and sylvia's small wan face began to grow a shade less colourless and thin presently the wail of the violin was heard again and her old occupations were resumed the first glow of the early summer was not to be recovered but a sober restfulness of spirit had fallen upon her like the calm of the still september days now brooding over all the sunlit land toward the middle of that month for the first time since he left paul missed a mail sylvia was disappointed and when he missed the second also much concerned but the following week she was consoled by a letter has he been ill she inquired when she forwarded it to jessica but jessica it would seem was too busy to answer the short notes in which she sent her various addresses containing beside them only hurried assurances that she had no time to say more after this came another and a longer gap in paul's correspondence and the letter which followed was lighter than any of his others then three whole weeks passed without a word from him to sylvia's equal comfort and relief jessica in her next letter made no comment on this omission she merely said that her address would be as it had been for two weeks now, Denbury Castle, Ludley, Loamshire, till Thursday next, when they all returned to Beechcroft. In a postscript she besought Sylvia to come over to lunch on Friday. That a letter from Paul might arrive before that day was now Sylvia's constant prayer, and it was granted on thursday afternoon when she came in from a long ramble through the park she found that the afternoon's post had brought her a letter in the well-known handwriting but the inner enclosure was not addressed as usual to jessica it was for sylvia herself she sat down in the old window-seat to read it with a vague presentiment of coming grief it was a very long a needlessly long letter such as people are apt to write when they have something unpleasant to confess the pith of it was contained in this sentence which followed a rather involved and bewildering preface you will gather from this that my feelings toward jessica have undergone some change and though i shall always entertain for her the highest respect and affection i cannot honestly say that she still holds the first place in my heart of course i shall abide by my promise if she still under the circumstances should wish me to do so i trust to you dear miss clanover who have always been such a friend to us both to explain this to jessica and let me know her decision 
Sylvia put her hand up to her head as if it had been struck. Her brain indeed reeled as if from a blow. Through the window, which she had forgotten to shut, the air came keen and cold, for over the darkening elms and their shadow glowed the delicate rose of a sharp frost, and from far away, from some distant world, wrapped in sunlight and warmth, came to her like a mocking echo the words and the music, for we shall breast the storm of time unshaken, and love to-morrow as we love to-day. It will kill Jessica, she thought first, then, remembering the assurance of all the story-tellers, no, grief does not kill, she will not die, worse, she will live with a broken heart. But as to telling Jessica, she did not waver, holding it even worse to have left her to waste her love and faith on one so unworthy. So after a night spent chiefly in imaginary rehearsals of the terrible task before her, she drove over to Beechcroft by woods and gardens which the frost had seared. Her knees shook together as she crossed the hall behind the servant who ushered her in. Should she find Jessica alone? The answer to this, as the drawing-room door opened before her, was a burst of chatter and laughter. The room was crowded as of old with Jessica's merry little court of admirers and companions. Mrs. Vane was there, too, and a man whom Sylvia had never seen before, short and red-faced. All this she perceived in a flash before Jessica came hastily across the room to welcome her. Jessica, not more beautiful than before, that in Sylvia's eyes was impossible, but brilliant, like a flower that more showers have revived. "'You darling, how glad I am to see you! Little frog, you are as cold as if it were winter!' Sylvia hardly heard what she said, or Mrs. Graham's kind greeting, and as they turned to welcome another visitor she sank into a seat beside mrs vane it had become suddenly clear to her that her errand was even more cruel than she had thought but mrs vane was talking and sylvia at last became aware of what she was saying and long settled out there and very rich so of course all the seymours are very pleased it is a much more suitable engagement than well i am glad they have both been so sensible about it as sylvia wondered what she meant by both jessica came gliding toward her dear little mouse i am pleased you have not forgotten your violin we want to try the duet after lunch i have been singing it a good deal at denbury castle with our host but it never sounds anything without your obligato by and by he is to take you in to luncheon let me introduce sir walter lawley it was the short red-faced man you play the violin a good deal don't you he said as they crossed the hall well i like it very much with the piano rather squeaky by itself don't you know but with something else it has a nice lively effect i should think it would be a great improvement to that duet especially as the tenor part is miles too high for me after that becoming seriously interested in the luncheon which was a remarkably excellent one he said little more and sylvia spoke even less she sat like one in a dream a horrible dream before the sparkling flower-crowned table with happy faces all around her while the china and the silver tinkled and the young people led by jessica greeted each other with jesting words and laughed exuberantly at nothing as is the pleasant way of youth and health colonel graham who was evidently in the best of tempers twice sent the butler to tempt her with champagne to bring back those roses of yours he called nodding kindly to the little white face are you a teetotaler asked sir walter disapprovingly never mind dear said mrs graham who sat at the other side of sir walter jessica has something nice to tell you after lunch such good news that will cheer you up good news the word seemed to wring her heart she felt faint even to sickness as she climbed upstairs 
after Jessica, who led the way with a step so light it was like dancing, to that well-known pink and white dressing-room, freshly set out in snow-white laces and crisp new bows. But first let me show you my new ulster. Not yet, not yet, gasped Sylvia, taking her friend's hands in hers. Oh, Jessica, sit down here with me. I have something to tell you. Darling, can you be very brave? Can you bear to hear terrible news, to know that the one you most trusted is, is— Sylvia broke down all the more hopelessly, because the amazement in the blooming face before her showed her that her words failed to convey any suspicion of what she meant to Jessica. "'I cannot tell you,' she cried, thrusting Paul's letter into Jessica's hands, "'and you would not, you could not believe. You must read it for yourself.' Then she hid her face in her hands and waited till when at last she felt jessica move and touch her gently on the head she started up and throwing herself on her knees before her outraged friend covered her hands with tears and kisses dear little sylvia don't cry like this mamma is quite right you take things much too seriously there was something not so much in the words as in the tone which made Sylvia instantly choke back the tears and look up quickly into Jessica's face. The beautiful dark eyes, undimmed by tears, were full of pitying concern. "'You poor little thing! You have quite disfigured your dear little face with crying!' She stretched out her long white hand toward a crystal scent bottle that stood upon a table near her, and, steeping her filmy handkerchief in its contents, began softly bathing Sylvia's forehead. "'You see, darling, I am not altogether surprised at what has happened, and not the least offended. I cannot blame Paul, poor fellow, for falling in love with somebody else. I could not expect him to go on caring only for me when there seemed no chance of our engagement ever coming to anything. It was quite hopeless, you know. Papa would never have consented, and I could not possibly marry against his wishes. I should have had nothing to live upon, and, besides, it would have been quite wrong, I consider." so I am only too glad Paul takes so sensible a view of it all. It is quite a relief to me, as it makes it much pleasanter for me to tell him what I had come to think about it myself. For, since I have been away and thought things over calmly, I have seen how foolish it was to go on fretting for a thing one couldn't have, like a child crying for the moon, you know instead of trying to make the best of things, and being content with life as one finds it. I had quite determined, as much for Paul's own good as for my own, to break off our engagement. In fact, I have all but promised to marry Sir Walter Lawley. Indeed, I think he considers that I have quite promised, and he has ordered the engagement ring. I am sure you will like him, dear. He is not exactly clever, but such a darling so sensible and solid just what one likes in a husband you know and and i assure you sylvia here jessica blushed softly and dropped her long lashes with the loveliest smile i never could have believed i should care so much for anybody as i do for him i never a knock at the door interrupted her Mrs. Graham had sent up to know if the young ladies could come down and try over the duet before Mrs. Vane left. Jessica went down at once, leaving Sylvia behind to bathe her face and smooth her ruffled locks, and while she helped her mother to get out the music and the stand, whispered to her Sylvia's gratifying tidings. "'Well, that is a comfort,' cried Mrs. Graham, "'and now I do hope Sylvia will be happy.' She was a little disappointed when Sylvia entered, quiet and composed indeed, but very pale. Everybody arranged themselves to listen. "'This is a great treat I have been quite looking forward to,' cried Mrs. Vane. "'Ah, now you will hear how it sounds with a real tenor,' cried Colonel Graham. 
" Dear papa," said Jessica, smiling indulgently on him, " he thinks everything Walter does perfection. Stand here, sir, and remember to sing well out at the crescendo." " It's rather soon after lunch," said Sir Walter, clearing his throat. " One, two, three !" cried Mrs. Graham, in an admonitory tone. They began, and the well known harmonies floated through the room. The singer stood as before, just between Sylvia and the door window. It had been thrown open to the sunny afternoon, and she could see through it a sky as blue as that of June itself ; but the boughs that crossed it were shrivelled and brown, the tropeolum was like cinders, and the lobelia like ashes. The first verse went very well, though the obbligato might have been a trifle louder. During the next four lines the violin grew fainter and faltered. Finally it ceased altogether, leaving the voices to sing unsupported, save by the piano, the words, For we shall breast the storm of time unshaken, and love to-morrow as we love to-day. I beg your pardon, said Sylvia meekly, but I feel rather faint, and I think perhaps I had better go home. Everybody was concerned. Colonel Graham and Jessica besought her not to go, but Mrs. Graham declared it was the wisest thing to do. And now, Sylvia, my dear, she said, when she had forced her to drink some wine and wrapped a shawl about her, we shall expect you to perk up and look well again, for you know there is nothing left to grieve about. Jessica is quite happy, and so is Mr. Seymour, and everything has ended as comfortably as possible. They all came out on the doorsteps to see her go, and bid her come back very soon. "'You must get strong and well by the middle of next month,' were Jessica's last words, "'to be my bridesmaid.' As the curve of the gravel sweep brought the departing carriage opposite the portico again, they were still there. Jessica kissed her hand to Sylvia, who was leaning forward toward the carriage window to look at them. They formed so happy a domestic group, Jessica, her lovely face bright with pleasure, standing between her lover and her father. No one was missed. Why should he be, since equally forgetful of them, he too was happy and contented? Sylvia could but repeat to herself Mrs. Graham's incontrovertible words. There was nothing to grieve for. Everybody was satisfied. All had ended well. End of story two. Story three. A rainy day. The day began well, too well, in fact, for toward noon its radiance was overclouded. A shadow fell on those crabbed German characters which Lydia invariably studied after breakfast, and on the silk and straw of which Madge, who did nothing invariably, was compounding a bonnet. I trust and hope, cried the latter with dramatic fervor, that it is not going to rain. From the depths of her heart Lydia re-echoed the wish, but she said nothing, as was her fashion when she felt much. Madge, in this as in most things the opposite to her sister, continued, Oh, no, I will not believe it. It could not be so cruel. It was only a cloud passing over the sun. She rose as she spoke, and, putting the unfinished headgear upon her chestnut curls, examined her reflection in the long mirror over the console. For a moment the light played brightly on the girlish vision, then the shadow fell again. She went to the open window and looked out. The cloud, which was slowly stifling the sun with fold upon fold of delicate grey vapour, had covered all the brilliant blue which arched so brightly above the opening day, and with that had vanished, too, the flame-like brilliancy of the geraniums in the garden and the roses about the window. "'Thomas,' she called anxiously, "'do you think it is going to rain?' Thomas paused in his work of rolling the lawn and, resting on the handle of the roller, inspected the sky with a look of profound calculation. I don't know zackly, miss, but it looks as if we might have some wet. But then again it met pass off. 
I could tell as much as that myself, murmured Madge impatiently, leaving the room for the hall outside it, where, beside the fishing rods, an aneroid was suspended on the varnished wall. The movable hand was exactly over the other, as it had been placed that morning early by the master of the house, and both, pointing directly to change, vouchsafed no more definite information than Thomas. Madge tapped the glass. The needle vibrated, but not in one direction more than another. She tapped it again, and it seemed to rise. She was about to persevere in a mode of treatment which was so efficacious, when a door behind her opened, and there appeared an elderly gentleman with a pen in his hand and an expression of strong irritation on his finely cut features. "'I think I have before explained to you, Margaret, that an aneroid is not a drum. It is not intended to be thumped in that violent manner, and will only be injured by so doing. I do wish you would adopt some other method of studying the weather." Madge made no reply, a remarkable circumstance, as, generally speaking, she must have the last word, but hastily re-entering the drawing-room, exclaimed, "'Oh, I was in such a fright lest he should happen to look at the umbrella-stand!' "'And why?' began Lydia, then paused, as their doubts and hopes were finally settled by a sound outside upon the gravel terrace, and she looked round to see the fair flat pastoral view all blurred and veiled by a sheet of fine rain, which fell not heavily, but steadily, after the manner of things which are likely to continue. "'It is pouring,' said Madge, with a look of such dismay as was not often seen upon her happy face. It will rain all day, said Lydia, her dark eyes beneath their delicate brows, distended with almost tragic intentness. It is all right for you, said Madge enviously, with her face still close to the window-pane, for now you will not be obliged to go to the Lawsons. No, Lydia somewhat faintly made answer, Uncle Bertram would not like the carriage to go out in such weather. Of course not. Besides, how could they possibly expect you, especially as it isn't a party? What an escape for you!" Lydia was silent, unable to explain the real state of her feelings. In a neighborhood where the standard of liveliness was far from high, the dullness of the Lawson family was a proverb. Even in their own house they did not attempt to keep up that ball of conversation which in country districts is apt to be so heavy. They sat still and listened to such remarks as might be made to them, replying as shortly as possible, till the mental stagnation, which apparently held them tongue-tied, spread gradually from them to their guests. The brightest languished, the most talkative faltered, and the visit ended in melancholy silence. And this was the family with whom Lydia longed to pass an afternoon, as perhaps in her brief life she had never longed for anything. "'The first bell has rung,' said Uncle Bertram significantly as he entered, "'and what is all that upon the floor?' In indirect answer, Madge commenced forthwith to gather up the various scraps with which, as was her custom when working, she had bestrewn the ground far and near, while Lydia departed with her Schiller and her dictionary. She crossed the hall with one dejected glance at the uncomforting aneroid mounted by the oak staircase to a landing furnished with well-filled bookcases, engravings, and china and through one of the five or six doors that opened on to it, entered her own room, a quaint chamber with a very low ceiling, polished wood floor, white draperies, and a square casement, about which great bunches of wisteria drooped. Through this casement, when she had finished drying her long pink-tipped fingers, she stood gazing wistfully. The ground sloped upward on this side of the house to a row of close-set elms, so she seemed to look into an almost skyless world of living green, all sad-colored and rain-bedewed. But of this she beheld nothing, for quite another scene was before her, and that, too, from the not very distant past. 
it was a large garden party which the lawsons with praiseworthy energy had roused themselves to give about three weeks ago she had played her turn at tennis and was resting apart from the main body of onlookers on a shady seat by the river eva lawson sat beside her it was not perhaps her right place as a hostess but seeing what her social talents were or rather were not she was probably as useful there as anywhere else at any rate she left lydia free in a kind of day-dream to watch the clear waters gliding past over the many-coloured pebbles and the long silken tresses of the weeds at last however eva was moved to speak here is mr calvert who is mr calvert asked lydia without the slightest desire to know oh one of the fishing club he is a friend of uncle edward's so we allow him to fish in our grounds i think he is coming here now i hope not lydia was unsociable enough to say a step on the gravel heralded his approach but lydia tried hard not to look round even when eva made haste to introduce the newcomer which in her anxiety to throw the onus of entertaining him on somebody else she did before she had answered his greeting a tall figure in the untidy dress affected by men when they go trout fishing was all that lydia saw or cared to see till he spoke she was sensitive to voices and his was rich and soft and deep suggestive of the tenderness and the strength of true manhood so that though he said only commonplace things in commonplace sentences as indeed under the circumstances was almost inevitable she was irresistibly drawn as she listened to look at the speaker and no sooner did she turn toward him her hitherto averted eyes than he hurriedly appealed to her about some matter of no comment in a manner so humble and with a glance so reverent it might have conciliated a much less gracious lady then as on wings did their converse seem to advance in ten minutes they were talking as if they had known each other for years of pictures and books and plays of opinions and tastes and even of feelings till when the tea-bell rang lydia heard it with unwonted regret the handle of her door was violently agitated as if some one was trying to wrench it out and then as lydia was by this characteristic action prepared to see madge came or rather fell into the room i think you ought to knock her sister mildly observed i know i ought but i am much too anxious to think of such a trifle as manners what is to become of me if uncle bertram should take it into his head to go out why what does it matter matter why he will find out that his umbrella is gone gone where ha ah, i only wish i knew did i not tell you yesterday when we were starting for the smarts and it looked as if it were going to rain i couldn't find my umbrella so you see there was no time to lose you were in the pony carriage and jerry was rearing and plunging so i just took uncle bertram's oh madge how could you it's all very well to say how could i how could i not pray i was not going to have my best hat spoiled and i did not know the rain would keep off till to-day however that is not the worst of it when we got to the smarts i put the umbrella into the umbrella stand you ought not to have let it out of your hands all day my dear lydia you are really too absurd how could i play lawn tennis with an umbrella in my hands and where could it be safer than in the stand well then did you find it there well no i did not when i came to look for it it was gone some brute had taken it the gong sounded and they went to lunch in the brown wainscoted dining-room hung with dark and indistinct paintings by old masters which uncle bertram had collected in belgium and france as they ate their lunch lydia with affected and madge with unaffected interest for the trouble was yet to come which could diminish her appetite they debated the possibility of its clearing or not clearing till at last their uncle observed there is no clearer sign of an empty mind than a habit of discussing the weather 
to say once for all that the day is fine or wet hot or cold may be allowable though it is quite unnecessary seeing that it is a fact which every one can discover for himself but to make such circumstances a subject of prolonged conversation or chatter rather for conversation it cannot be called is quite unpardonable all the same i should like to know whether it is going to clear said madge who was not easily abashed as if not we can't go out well even then i presume you have resources enough to enable you to exist indoors for one day and if you have any imperative call to go out it is not impossible if you go properly prepared i myself intend going over to mr smart's to see this new find of his which he declares is a vandevelde not in this rain surely uncle you will get soaked no my dear madge not with my umbrella which is a very different thing to those flimsy en tout cas as you call them which you and lydia are fond of using i selected it with great care at the stores when i was last in town it was expensive but i flatter myself it was worth the money you won't go out directly after lunch will you uncle no i shall wait to see what the afternoon post brings there was thus about an hour and a half left in which to avoid discovery i know what i shall do confided madge to lydia when they returned to the drawing-room i will send thomas for the umbrella where will you send him first to the smarts to see if by any chance the umbrella has been returned then to the woods and the marshes to see if they have taken it as they were the only people at the party one of them must have taken it i only wish you had a better messenger than thomas poor thing he is so so hopelessly idiotic but i shall make it so plain that even a hopeless idiot could not make a mistake the first thing was through the instrumentality of lisbeth the parlour-maid to summon thomas from the kitchen garden the next to interview him at the pantry window as being the furthest removed from the study whereto mr bertram dacres had again betaken himself to the long and lucid explanation of his mission which madge unfolded thomas listened as was his custom not merely with an attentive but with an almost solemnly thoughtful countenance as if one whose whole mind is concentrated on the matter before him and now thomas you clearly understand what i want you to do oh yes miss i understand all right first i go to miss smart's with master's umbrella but at last a clearer view of his task seemed borne in upon him and he went off to saddle jerry crossing the yard in deference to madge's exhortations to make haste at a kind of trot considerably slower than a brisk walk would have been in the drawing-room lydia was reading not for the first time two little notes which on madge's re-entrance she slipped hurriedly under the violet satin square she was embroidering with saffron silk and yet all the world might have read the conventional sentences with which in the one mr calvert accepted miss dacre's invitation to tea and tennis and in the other entreated her acceptance of the new book which she had desired to see lydia had read these curt and prosaic compositions over and over again they afforded her a pleasure the like of which she had never experienced and which she would have thought it impossible for any one else to understand or describe to-day it occurred to her that perhaps mendelssohn had felt something akin to it for madge who had sat down to practise her scales suddenly changed to a more tuneful and harmonious strain she began playing with her peculiar liquid touch an allegro of mendelssohn's sparkling as a sunny spring morning with an undertone of caressing tenderness of which lydia felt for the first time the significance as well as the beauty for lydia though renowned for her common sense and her practical abilities was not of an artistic temperament or a romantic disposition and it had required nothing less than the process of falling in love to open her eyes or should we say heart to one great side of human nature 
and the art which interprets it the door opened and the music ceased if you please miss said lisbeth mrs smart sends her love and she has looked everywhere for the umbrella but she cannot find it well is that all that is the message thomas gave me miss oh that madge murmured with a long-drawn breath before she fled from the room to confront and catechize this most inexpert messenger did i not tell you three times at least that if you did not find the umbrella you were to go straight on to mrs wood's and to mrs marsh's to see if it was there certainly miss certainly said thomas evidently perplexed but i thought as how you would like fur to know as it weren't at mrs mart's what does it matter to me where it is not oh dear how much precious time you have lost pray be off as fast as you can first to mrs wood's and then to mrs marsh's and don't come back without the umbrella you know what it is like don't you green silk with a silver handle meanwhile lydia was still struggling against despair one forlorn hope at least remained it might clear and if it did so within half an hour she might still take tea with the lawsons she went to the window and peered eagerly out alas on every side rain 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 not a gleam not a break in all that sullen sky a ring at the front door bell made her start but when the drawing-room door opened a few minutes afterward only madge came in it was the post but there was nothing for us everything was for uncle bertram and it was the greatest mercy explained madge who only the day before had bitterly complained of a similar circumstance as it will keep him employed for a time it is raining less heavily i fancy but he will still want his umbrella if the rain is not so bad perhaps the lawsons might expect me said lydia wistfully looking toward the window oh gracious no answered madge with the kindest intentions it is not like a party there is no one to meet you no that is unless any one should happen to drop in but who is there to drop in all the fishing men have gone you know but they had not all gone as lydia knew on the very best authority and alas the last of them and only one for whom lydia cared a straw would leave to-morrow had he not himself told her so the day before yesterday at the tennis meeting where he arrived so late as to make it a wonder to all but a few preternaturally sharp-sighted onlookers why he arrived at all if i look in at the lawsons on thursday then i shall be sure to find you shall i not i leave on friday my rooms are wanted and i have not had a chance of speaking to you to-day in this crowd he spoke the last words in an aggrieved tone as if the hostess had shown a want of proper feeling in asking any one besides lydia and himself to her party but his resentment though irrational had not been altogether displeasing to her is any one coming with me asked mr dacre looking in i am just starting no not even madge i suppose you have mislaid your umbrella as usual never mind you shall have a share of mine it is exceptionally large he smiled indulgently evidently his letters had been of a most agreeable character and he was in the sweetest temper which only rendered the impending catastrophe the more deplorable oh lydia lydia cried madge as the door closed behind him what shall i do the answer to this piteous outcry was a ring at the door lisbeth looked in a few minutes later to see if a master was there as john smith wanted to see him it was a reprieve and a very valuable one as the interview was not likely to be brief seeing it concerned a certain cabinet designed by mr dacre and executed by smith over which they had now for full six weeks been quarrelling as a dignified gentleman and a respectful artisan can quarrel each being secretly but profoundly convinced of the other's total ignorance of the business at hand for what as mr dacre so often asked his nieces can an ignorant bumpkin like that know of artistic fitness 
just as smith propounded to his wife the riddle what does he know about such work why he couldn't make so much as a rabbit hutch five o'clock struck and the ever welcome tea-tray appeared but for once de quincey's dictum was at fault and happiness did not enter with it madge indeed managed to consume a respectable quantity of thin bread and butter and even cake as well as two cups of tea but not she professed with so keen an enjoyment as usual but why do not you eat something lydia you have not lost an umbrella what is that it was lisbeth's carrying a long brown paper parcel if you please miss thomas have brought the umbrella oh bless him bless him cried madge snatching at the parcel and tearing it open in frantic haste then suddenly followed an exclamation of a different character low and deep what is the matter asked lydia rather languidly look cried madge in tones of withering scorn look at uncle bertram's brand-new silk umbrella with a silver handle and she held forth at arm's length as if it had been some noxious reptile which could sting an umbrella whose handle was of the most unpretending description whose gingham cover dark brown in hue had been worn and even perforated by winter and rough weather but what is this about asked lydia picking up a note which had fallen to the floor and handing it to her sister madge read it aloud with her own interpolations dearest madge we have searched all over the house well that need not take long one would suppose she lived in a palace and i cannot find your umbrella unless it is this one which has been lying here for weeks idiot when it was lost only yesterday i fancy i have seen you with one something like it that i am sure she has not no one ever saw me with anything so vulgar and shabby hoping it is the right one i remain yours affectionately caroline wood she finished by dashing the umbrella into the fireplace where fortunately there was no fire only the next instant to recover it with equal impetuosity and conceal it together with its string and paper wrappings just as with his usual deliberate step mr dacre was heard approaching while mr dacre sipped his tea and decanted on the combined obstinacy and conceit with which for more than an hour he had been contending lydia slipped quietly away she climbed the stairs as if she had been walking for miles and when she reached her room threw herself upon her little bed and buried her head in its snowy counterpane she was crying yes literally crying the sedate and sensible lydia least given of all girls to hysterical outbreaks she was crying because she could not go out to tea yet no that did not fairly state her case she protested defending herself against herself and raising her head and supporting it on her hands she gazed thoughtfully before her though whether the real explanation was more to her credit she was not quite so certain into what state of mind had she allowed herself to drift that her happiness should depend on the sight of one who perhaps cared little whether he saw her or no true he had seemed to seek her society but perhaps that might be only because they had so many interests in common and as to the looks and words which had seemed once to mean so much in the shadow of this most depressing day their sweet significance faded as glowing color vanishes in the flowers which we carry from the sunlight to the shade yes doubtless she had been very foolish building the loveliest of castles on foundations slighter than the clouds but if he did not care for her it was the more likely he would go on the morrow perhaps never to return so the rain had deprived her of her one last hope of seeing him and hearing him speak in the bitterness of this thought she pressed her lips together and shut her eyes as if wincing from bodily pain but when she opened them again her tears gleamed like a dazzling mist before her and she felt the warm touch of sunlight on her hands and face it came straight through the casement from the west 
where just above the elm tops in a sea of blue between the parting rain clouds the sun shone gloriously on the declining day alas like so many good things his triumph came too late at half past five there was no decent pretext for keeping an engagement to afternoon tea oh lydia only think cried madge bursting into the room it is all right the umbrella has come what is the matter a headache oh poor dear try some pyretic saline it always cures mine but is it not a mercy about that umbrella jane marsh took it home last night by mistake and then finding it was not hers thought it might be the lawson's and sent it there why goodness only knows since they were not at the smarts party lydia felt quite conscience-stricken at her own comparative indifference to a piece of information so momentous and with a gallant effort to shake off this self-absorption and assume a little sympathy even if she had it not asked who brought it who brought it replied madge slowly and with a divided mind half of her attention being concentrated on her hair which she was rearranging before the toilet table lydia in what a much more becoming light you have managed to get your looking-glass than mine is but about the umbrella oh uh, eva lawson sent it over by lydia i think my hair high up like this suits me by mr uh, mr uh, thingamy you know may i have some of these hairpins thank you he is downstairs now he asked for you but i suppose if you have a headache you don't care to go down lydia's attention had wandered during this speech but at the end she roused herself once more to ask without the faintest curiosity who is downstairs why mr uh, oh dear i can't remember his stupid name that tall man you are always uh, mr calvert that's it may i come in said mr dacre's voice pray can neither of you come downstairs to entertain mr calvert at this moment while i have left him to look for some etchings he wishes to see he remains quite alone in the drawing-room while he knows you are both in the house you show a great want of consideration toward a well-informed man if it had been on the contrary one of those empty-headed fops the smarts or the marshes you would have been down directly to receive them well i can't come down till i have done up my hair and lydia is ill ill cried mr dacris with his eyes on lydia's rosy cheeks no 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 i am not at all ill she cried hastily departing but she was quite pale by the time she reached the drawing-room and her heart was beating as if it would choke her it was very kind of you to walk over with the umbrella she controlled her trembling lips to say with quite conventional politeness yes very kind generous even seeing i had no other inducement or motive and in the light of his smile all her misgivings vanished and within as without it was perfectly fine end of story three story four granny lovelock at home the afternoon sun shot one bright broken spear of light through the lattice window it gleamed in crimson and green fire on the fuchsias snow-white on granny's cap and the pillows that supported her dull gold on the russet coils of ella's hair through the door set open to the summer air came scents of sweet familiar flowers but no clink of spade in the cottage gardens or a jar of heavy wheels upon the road and the tiny bassoon of one unresting bee boomed loud above the sabbath stillness na twan a rain to-day observed granny and jerge will just about enjoy ee's walk i feels of it being so tired along o me but there tis no good talkin for whatever can i do without em seein i've no power in me for to lift myself let alone git about and as to goin into the union as some folks seems to think why that i want it there's mrs bird uh, says uh, to me other day why granny you'd be wonderful comfortable there what i says along o them all and squallin babies 
to drive me pretty nigh wild, I zay. And I wants a lot of tendin' to, I does, particularly nights when I don't close my eyes half the time. Often I be fossed to wait in charge for un to come and set aside me for a little company like. Why, mother, I say the other night, I ad but just a dropped off when you called me. I feels pretty nigh wore out. They say you be, says I, but tain't no use to complain, for tis the law doin, I says, and I will do what I as of mine too. From where she sits propped up upon her little bed, so close to the window, Granny looks out upon such a view as on the far-off frontiers of the empire they see in homesick dreams, the little cots whose eaves drop almost to the flowers that cluster round them, great bowers of verdure where the apples redden, fields that the river keeps forever green, and just behind the line of poplars a rim, a ripple, which only in the lowest lowland could be called a hill. But of all this Granny takes little heed, if she even sees it. Her interests are purely human, and as neither man, woman, nor child is to be seen on the road which winds from Sedley Court to Vernon Manor, she turns to let her eyes rest on the slim figure of her visitor, now gazing straight before her with rather a pensive look in her girlish eyes. Bain't very well be ye to-day, Miss Vernon? Oh, yes, thank you, Granny, I am quite well. E looks rather white. You was tired, I reckon, being out so long yesterday. There was a great to do at Sedley Court, weren't there, Miss Vernon? I did not go, Granny. Would you like me to read you a chapter in the Bible? Do be sure. There's the big Bible on the green wool mat on their table, just neath the little picture. E didn't go. Now I thought I seed my lady and Miss Flora go by in the carriage without e, and a wonderful lot went by too, and de Vere's and the Haywards and them new folks at the Priory. But e didn't go, Miss Vernon? No, Granny. What chapter would you like me to read to you? Any chapter, Miss Vernon. You can't go wrong. Tis all good in the Bible. But I'm surprised you didn't go yesterday. Your two families, the Verdons and the Sedleys, was all as terrible friendly, time out of mind. I've a-heard my grandfather tell it. Terrible friends they was, but fell out they did most years over the shootin'. Once I mind your grandfather, Sir Dacris, and the old squire Sedley, they was so put out, one with the other, that the squire said, ne'er a one o' his family would set foot no more in the court, and Sir Dacri said no more shouldn't hisn in the manor. And your aunt, Miss Georgina, was in a sad way, and so was Mr. Edward, as we called him. We allus looked for it that Mr. Edward would marry Miss Georgina, but they didn't, the old gents being so contrary but mr edward went off to furrin parts a fightin and miss georgina took up and married with a gentleman in yorkshire then come the news that mr edward was killed in battle and the old squire was pretty nigh broken-hearted and sir dacris uh, rode straight over to the manor he did and shook hands with him and they was as pleasant and kind together as iver you see till come september and then they fell out again but lord bless ye they had terrible queer tempers both on em sir dacris he must have ease way in everything right or wrong and as to old squire if ever a one did cross he'd swear and holler to that degree you may heard on t'other side of the county but a kind-hearted gentleman ever i see and so they was all for i lived with one fust scullery maid and then still room maid seven years till i married but seems to me the gentry is quieter nor they were and more sense with one too there's young mr henry sedley come in here t'other day and spoke as civil as ere a one granny i says do you know if miss vannon's is the village she have but just gone from here i says she be gone up to old job monks thank you granny he says and have you believe me he gave me a half a sovereign just about a nice young gent i call him shall i read you the twenty-third psalm granny if you please tis a beautiful psalm and no mistake why here be all the chapel folks come out already and mrs sims as smart as if it was with jit trimmin on her mantle and big red rose stuck atop of her hat and the children with parasols ever one on and lord a massy there's that gal of the smiths just come home from service with sleeves blown out a top just like yourn miss vernon Pon my word, I don't know what poor folks be a comin' to. They're deal smarter work days now than there was a Sundays when I was a gal. 
But la, to be sure, if there bain't young Meester Sedley a coming down the road, and a smartish pace too. The young gent can step out when he's a mind to. I reckon he's going straight to the manor, Miss Vernon. No, I bain't neither. He's a coming in here, I do believe. And indeed, at that very instant, the doorway was darkened by a big, broad-shouldered young man, who paused suddenly on the threshold as he met Ella's eye just as if he had not expected to see her there i am afraid i intrude he began with very distant politeness lord bless ee no come in mr sedley tis only miss vernon a readin of the bible she be good enough to come and zet while along me most sunday afternoons while my son takes his walk come in mr sedley do ee i be allus pleased to see one o your family good friends they was to me and mine in the old time there are some people granny replied mr henry sedley icily as accepting the invitation he took off his hat who don't care for old friends ay that's true you may depend on it i've a-lived in this row ten years come next michaelmas and if you'll believe me not one of the neighbours drops in for to see me mrs tibb she come in yesterday the first time since ever i was took bad la i says tis wonderful to see you i s'pose you ain't got no company at home to-night and there are some people granny remarked ella in the same key as henry sedley who don't show very much consideration for their old friends feelings when they do meet them no more they don't miss van and that's sartin true some folks ain't got no more feelin in em than that there's kittle there's mrs beard eh says to me as i ad a lot to be thankful for cause i wasn't nigh so bad as job monk as can't sleep night nor day with the pine in his legs and don't dare take no sleepin stuff cause i ees hot why that's a pretty lot to be thankful for that is who knows what i suffers a lyin here and can't do so much as a piece of needlework but why don't you do it down mr enry miss bunnam my dear if you was to take your chair back a bit mr enry could set down beside ye this is by no means in accord with miss vernon's own intention or desire but there is nothing left to do seeing it is the mistress of the house but submit willingly or unwillingly to her decree it is very warm in the cottage for a wood fire burns in the huge chimney place heating the kettle for afternoon tea granny has yawned more than once lately and now somewhat sleepily contemplates her young guests sitting stiffly on their chairs and showing no disposition to entertain each other tis like old times to see you two for you features your uncle edward wonderful mr enery and miss vernon is as like her aunt georgina as two pays and her hair too just the same took up high in the back and ringlets in front good to the poor they was too and zo was you all vernons and sedleys many a time i's a seen miss georgina go by with her little basket just like miss vernon there and mr edward of a zine too fine a fine upstanding zot granny was asleep they heard her regular breathing and the loud tick of the pendulum that swung beneath the painted clock outside not a sound even the bee had yielded to that all-pervading all-persuasive silence and was taking his rest with the others and uh, now perhaps miss vernon i may hush don't speak so loud you will waken granny as it is impossible to be sardonic in a whisper he was compelled to change his tone well then ella i think you owe me an explanation why after promising to come to our tennis meeting yesterday did you never turn up after all i never promised i would go you never did you not say on thursday afternoon when i was mending your racket that you would let me take you in to tea well of course i meant i should do so if i went to your party oh ella it is too bad you know very well you made me believe you were coming well so i should have gone if you had behaved nicely pray how did i not behave nicely well i hear that after dinner on thursday you went on in a most extraordinary way why who has dared now don't speak disrespectfully it was papa oh indeed and pray what did papa say 
I cannot answer you if you speak in that horrible tone. I beg your pardon. What did Sir William Vernon accuse me of? I don't know that I ever saw you so disagreeable as you are today. Well, I don't find you as pleasant as I could wish. But what did your father say? Well, he said you talked in a wild, radical sort of way about everything, and that you wished to take all the land away from the landowners and give it to the poor. Oh, did he? Then all I can say is that he told— I mean he gave an entirely wrong impression of what I did say. I only said that the transfer of land should be made easy so that those who wanted to sell and those who wanted to buy might do so. Ah, I don't pretend to understand politics, but I dare say it comes to much the same thing in the end. But it made papa very cross indeed, and I have asked you over and over again not to talk in that kind of way to him. You know it always makes him angry. But, my dearest Ella, if he asks me my opinion point-blank, how can I refuse to give it? But if you wouldn't talk politics with him, he wouldn't ask your opinion about them. He began it, not I. But you should change the subject. Mamma and I always do, directly he talks of politics or manorial rights. Did you not notice that very night at dessert, when he began talking about the disestablishment of the church, Mamma said what a beautiful altar-cloth Mrs. Lee was working. Yes, and what was the consequence? After you left the room, he said there was no having any rational conversation with women present, and at once started the subject of land tenure. And I dare say you were ready enough to contradict him. I never saw any one so fond of arguing in my life. You see, you argue even with me if I would argue with you. But I won't, for I think it's so silly, especially about things that are of no real consequence. And all I can say is that you made papa very angry, and he said, after you had gone, that he thought Cambridge had quite spoilt you, and that Mr. Charles Hayward was much superior to you, and he wrote to him next day, and offered him a day's fishing. Indeed, and may I ask what day Hayward came over? He came over yesterday, and— Oh, he did, did he, replied Henry, suddenly changing from a very hurried to a very slow and emphatic delivery. Now I understand it all clearly. You might just as well have said, frankly, instead of inventing so many excuses, that you did not condescend to come to our meeting yesterday, because you were more agreeably employed at home, because you preferred Mr. Hayward's society to— if you only came in here to insult me, I think you had better go away. I don't see that you have any right to turn me out of another person's house. Still, of course, if my presence is hateful to you, I will remove it. Long since, forgetful of their hostess's slumbers, they had raised their voices above the first well-chosen pitch, and the crash with which Henry now put back his chair was quite enough to rouse her. Oh, 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 cried Granny, awaking. Whatever shall I do? I be slept entirely on one side, and I've got a cramp in that arm so bad I don't know how to bear myself. Let me lift you up again, Granny, cried Ella, rising. Lord bless you, you couldn't left me. There's not a many can. I be a smartish white, and I can tell ee there's Mrs. Bunn catched old on me the other day, and pretty nigh let me drap. All I did jest about let me lift you granny said henry i'll not let you drop when my mother was ill i used often to lift her and she said i did it as well as the nurse very gently then if you please master henry for my poor arm there is tender and miss Vernon, my dear so soon as ever mr henry shes me do he put the pillow strike a more untimely interruption never was for how was it possible while thus engaged to maintain that lofty dignity of bearing which both had at once assumed to do them justice they forgot their wrongs till their task was accomplished and then why then one at least of the offended twain was in a different mood actions are sometimes more eloquent than words which is fortunate since so many people like ella 
are indifferent to oratory and impervious to reason and as she watched the deft tenderness with which the strong young arms raised the old and helpless frame it was borne in upon her that there are qualities which like charity cover many sins even the cherishing of heretical opinions and the still more blameworthy habit of unseasonably proclaiming them so when granny being settled as she would be he looked up prepared to meet a contemptuous glance with one equally scornful he encountered instead a bright and indulgent smile none the less delightful because it was completely incomprehensible and bewildering to him and his resentment and his jealousy were instantly forgotten i was pretty nigh asleep when i come to slep so what was you a sayin to me master annery oh i was only telling miss vernon as i do again that i never said i wanted to take all the land from the rich and give to the poor lord a mercy save my art alive what ever makes folks that such tales about and no reason in it neither for whatever should us do with it why there were some poor silly chaps here as can't do such as keep their lotments tidy tis like that man as come here a preachin at the corner just opposite the public says we don't want squires no more and tis all very well for the likes o e i says as o as so much as ever a wants to ate and drank i says and spreein all over the country af east time but what ud come to as poor sick folk to ef there weren't no gentry we shouldn't have nothin but the parish and that wouldn't keep any one alive why ef it wasn't twere the beef and the milk i gets from my lady and the wine and soup i gets from the pisons and little bits o puddin one and the other gives me why i should be entirely starved and what i say granny said ella is that i dare say it was all a mistake and i believe if he tells me so that he never said anything of the kind but i do think that where people differ especially young people and old people it is much better not to talk politics at all uh, to be sure miss vernon and that's what i says a many times to judge when i wants to argify with me and i says you young folks cause you've had a bit of schoolin and you can set up a readin the newspapers you thinks a wonderful deal of yourselves but i tell you what it is i says you're a poor weak sort to what your grandfathers was why they could do more work on bread and turnips than ever you can on bacon and eggs and butter and so they could miss vernon added granny yawning i can't think what's come o them can't do this can't do that mustn't work no more than eight hours i ain't no patience with such ways i ain't tell ye her head dropped forward a little uh, granny was asleep once more and again they felt over all things that wonderful and unspeakable quiet like the shadow of some beloved presence blessing and healing all the wayworn world it soothed even the eager beating of their young hearts and they did not speak but his arm stole gently round her and she lifted her fresh young lips to his and in one long kiss was lost and forgotten the last feud of the sedleys and vernons bible readin no there wa'n't no bible readin bless ye miss bunner she talks right on in till mr Enery come in and then they said a cotton but george you just hustle about a bit i wants my tea bad i do End of story four. Story five. Miss Audrey at home. Before the old dower house to the garden side, they walked up and down in the warm geranium scented midday. He was in love with her, though he was only fifteen, deeply in love, or he would have been spending this bright September day very differently. He watched her furtively with such close and tender attention as he had accorded hitherto only to the rabbits he cherished and the caterpillars he collected. The sun shimmered upon her fair hair and bathed her young face smooth as a nectarine, delicate in hue as its blossom. Only her soft gray eyes were shaded by the filmy handkerchief she had draped above her forehead, and in those eyes there was the far-off look he often saw there, and which perplexed and disturbed him. He wished she would say something, so long had she been silent, and his wish, when it was granted, made him open his eyes, for her utterly unaccountable and appropriate question was, 
what time does a shooting party usually break up a shooting party why not at any time in particular it depends on the season and the weather and i mean a shooting party at this time of the year and on a day like this oh i don't know exactly they generally have had enough of it by five by five in a tone of inexplicable disappointment well there's no set time of course it depends now old general lee for instance she turned her limpid eyes full upon him would be ready to leave off to-day long before that but his nephew she turned her face away that great heavy chap you know uh, do you mean mr dalrymple she said bending to smell a gloire de dijon rose yes dalrymple he's so keen they say he'll go on as late as ever he can oh i think i must go in and practice now she went slowly up the stone steps between the iron railings buried in flaming sweet peas and disappeared through the long door window while he watched her with mingled wonder and disappointment she was the first woman he had ever studied and he found her more puzzling than euclid or homer she was always doing or saying something he did not expect and for no reason that he could see she was in high spirits when there was nothing particular to enliven any one and silent and absent-minded when there was every excuse for being happy she was wild about a thing one day and indifferent to it the next and as just now she would rush at a subject eagerly as if intensely interested in it and then suddenly and wholly drop it as if she had never cared for it at all but there the lawn must be marked afresh and he strode off to find andrews and the marking machine singing the latest comic song as he went in a style which made miss audrey even in the seclusion of her own room on the first floor wince and shut her eyes with anguish as well as bitterly repent the rash impulse which had led her to wreck the peace of her well-conducted house by inviting two young people to stay there and indeed the jovial refrain of harry's song did by no means harmonize with the sweet and melancholy strains uprising from the drawing-room where juliet accompanying herself on the grand piano sang and dreamt in that mellow twilight which was all of the glowing day the lowered venetian admitted i like that song best of all you sing some one had said to her a few evenings ago do you admire sybil very much she had answered with that assumed carelessness of manner by which instinctively she shielded herself from the perilous earnestness of his when they were alone together who is sybil why the author of the song you have just been admiring i know nothing about the author and i don't care i like the song because you sang it the first time i met you there was nothing very subtle or very beautifully turned in this compliment juliet even in her brief time had received many a better but the effect of a speech does not always depend upon the words alone in his voice in his eyes was that tenderness peculiar to masculine natures when they soften the mere recollection of it now made juliet's breath come quicker and pursued by a thought half alluring and half terrifying she left the piano and wandered restlessly about the long low room with its treasures of china and chippendale set forth after the stiff fashion of a bygone day the bell rang and she went up to bathe her flushed face and ruffle her hair becomingly before the glass and as the gong sounded went down the slippery stairs passed the hall door wide open to the carriage drive and entered the dining-room where the whiteness and the glitter of the luncheon-table were in brilliant relief against a background of dark draperies oak panelling and venerable paintings harry was there already crisp and cool to behold in his pink and white tennis suit but miss audrey had not yet appeared so they waited for her juliet at the window with her eyes seeking something beyond the uttermost rim of the horizon harry watching juliet and simmons at the sideboard erect and impassive as usual 
Then Miss Audrey's quick, almost agitated footfall was heard, and she entered like the spirit incarnate of the old world rose-embalmed house. She was one of those lovely old ladies whom only our own maligned climate can produce, with a blush-rose complexion much flattered by the powdery whiteness of her abundant hair. Her attire, though Quaker-like in design and colour, was a masterpiece of careful study and execution in silver-gray satin and lace as delicate as a spider-web. With this a dignified bearing and manners, whose one fault was a certain air of preoccupation and even anxiety not to be looked for in a mortal so favoured by fate. But Miss Audrey's otherwise shadowless existence was darkened by one care, the care of her health. Not that there was anything the matter with it, but there would have been, so an instinct truer than all the doctors told her, but for her unrelaxing vigilance against fatigue, excitement, and indigestion. When a window had been shut to protect her throat, and a blind lowered to save her eyes, they all sat down, and Harry lunched, Juliet pretended to do so, while Miss Audrey dieted on toast and a portion of mutton-chop prepared in a singularly elaborate and unpalatable way, composed by a fashionable physician. When she had finished, she spoke, drawing her lace draperies over her shoulder with a pretty fussy movement of her lovely hands. I hope, my dears, that it is clearly understood that only Willie and Mary Gray are coming here this afternoon. Perkins gave me quite a shock this morning by talking of a party. I said, There is no party, Perkins. Mr. and Miss Gray are coming to play tennis with Miss Vere and Mr. Harry, and they will take tea quietly with them afterward on the lawn as usual. But there is no party the state of my health would not allow of such a thing for a moment as it is i have been doing a great deal too much lately and if i am not more careful i shall suffer for it i don't know when i have seen so many people as during the last two weeks it is too exciting for me altogether i am afraid we are too tiring for you cousin millicent said juliet conscience-stricken no my dear it is not exactly that but since you came, people have been rather inconsiderate about calling. I have been thinking it over, and except when you were out at some party, one visitor at least has called here every day. And as to Mr. Dariample, he has been here five times in one week. That is absurd, you know. Very, cried Juliet cordially, groping for something under her chair. "'Well, he won't turn up to-day, anyhow,' cried Harry, with unfeigned satisfaction, "'for he is shooting with his uncle nine miles away, near Enbury. "'Now I am going to lie down and keep very quiet for an hour. "'So, Harry, my dear, if you wish to sing, "'you will oblige me very much by going to the kitchen-garden "'or the shrubberies where you cannot be heard from the house.' "'All right, aunt,' said Harry cheerfully, adding, however, when she had gone, what rot it all is if she was to take a ten-mile walk every day and eat a raw beefsteak she'd be right as a trivet it's almost a pity we arranged to have this game said juliet languidly with her forehead pressed close against the window-pane why you said yourself the day before yesterday that you would like it awfully but Juliet, unwilling to explain that she then understood the party, would probably include three instead of two guests, retired without further parley, leaving Harry once more in amazement at the inconstant character of her sex. He was very pleased with the party, Mary Gray played very well for a girl, and Willie, a first-rate fellow, never monopolized Juliet like that conceited beast Dariemple and others. At three the Greys arrived, and Juliet reluctantly came down to meet them. She was in that mood when nothing but poetry is congenial, and the Greys were all prose. Never wholly alive, it seemed to her, save on the tennis-ground. They soon set to work, work it truly was in Juliet's case, and the ball flew backward and forward, and the progress of the game was duly chanted by the boys' voices 
as the lime shadows crept slowly across the lawn across the flower beds crimson and gold and mist-like blue even to the feet of the players at a quarter to four miss audrey came out and paced slowly to and fro upon the gravel she was carefully protected against the inclemency of the season but even her mufflings were picturesque and her large black hat might have graced a portrait by gainsborough the gravel path led straight as an arrow past the house and the lawn to the little wood beyond and pausing on the brink of that miss audrey looked into aisles of ivy garlanded stems seen through a mystic darkness pierced by shafts of light which tempted her onward so she went following the undulating path till a sudden turn brought her into the carriage drive just opposite the lodge gate then only did she perceive how imprudent she had been for she found herself face to face with a victoria full of gorgeously attired ladies who at sight of her raised murmurs of respectful delight and admiration no wonder since now for three years had the hutchinses who rented the old priory which its owner was no longer rich enough to inhabit been calling assiduously at the dower house without once being fortunate enough to set eyes on its mistress and indeed with such ill success might they have continued to pay like homage for ever save for this happy or unhappy accident as it took all miss audrey's sense of honour and duty to induce her to receive the scions of those irreproachable families who had been the neighbours of her own for centuries but even to interlopers with fortunes freshly made behind a counter and glaring signs of their base origin visible in their looks and dress it was impossible for miss audrey to say with her own lips that she was not at home so with unconcealed melancholy which they mistook for great distinction of manner she invited them to enter and conducted them back to the lawn juliet at the sound of the steps upon the gravel started and blushed rosy red but when she turned her head and perceived the newcomers the colour quickly faded i say let's go on playing hard said harry with great presence of mind or perhaps they may want to join and spoil it all miss audrey might have been glad of such a diversion as it was she sat on a garden seat between her guests and reflected that if little entertainment was offered they would all the more speedily depart but the hutchinses required no entertainment it was sufficient bliss and very unlooked-for bliss too to find themselves seated in the innermost sanctum of the most exclusive of all the county ladies joy irradiated every feature as they contemplated the scene before them and commented on it in terms not unworthy of the garden of eden itself i never saw anything to compare with it never cried mrs hutchins heavenly quite heavenly i call it but i'm sure we never thought you ad a party or it is not began miss audrey emphatically but the words died on her lips as a long train of females marshalled by simmons was seen advancing from the house why here's another lot cried harry causing juliet once more to quiver with a thrill of unreasonable hope but no they were all women lady dora and her daughters meantime lady dora as she sailed across the turf was making her own reflections on the scene if even the hutchinses had been invited it was worse than strange that an old friend like herself whose hospitality had been so lavishly bestowed on miss audrey's young relations should have been forgotten and she determined to let that lady know what she felt here we are you see dear all uninvited but i was quite sure when i heard you had a party that you would like us to look in i know quite well i said it is an oversight one of the young people has forgotten to post a letter or give a message for dear miss audrey and i are such friends and she is always so good in letting me see a great deal of her young cousins and nieces that i know she will feel hurt if we do not put in an appearance you know began miss audrey solemnly that i never give parties 
"'No, you do not as a rule, I know, dear, but I think it so wise of you to break your rule, for I am sure it is good for one to keep up social habits, even though one feels disinclined. How do you do, Mrs. Hutchins?' As she turned toward that lady, Miss Audrey seized the opportunity to hurry after Simmons and stop him, just as he was re-entering the house. "'Simmons, remember, after this I am at home to nobody.' "'Very well, mum, but I suppose I had better say at home to Mrs. Freelands?' "'Mrs. Freelands?' "'Yes, um, uh, she's at the door now, I think. She was coming up the drive behind Lady Dora, so I expect she see her ladyship come in and will know as you are at home.' Miss Audrey felt that her mind would give way. There was no question about Mrs. Freelands's position, since she had married the head of one of the oldest county families, but of her origin, save that she came from the Antipodes, nothing was known, though, so Lady Dora once meaningly remarked, much might be conjectured. She was a sparkling brunette, who moved like a fairy, dressed like a Parisian of the great world, and spoke with the twang of a cockney Arab. "'Oh, this is jolly!' she cried, running up to Miss Audrey, and shaking her hands with great heartiness. "'This is first-rate! Let me introduce Mr. Brown, Miss Sharp. I always wanted you to have a party here. I always said it was a shameful waste of such a place as this not to give one. And so you have plucked up courage at last and done it. Ain't you glad now? Don't it look lovely? Only you haven't half enough people.' you'll do better next time for now you've begun you'll go on won't you one every week or every fortnight eh it will do you ever so much good nothing so perks me up when i am seedy as seeing a lot of people and having a regular jollification well how are you all getting on there with your game hello i say mr gray you've got a hole in your racket miss audrey made no further attempt at justification or defence she had sunk into a chair with a look of unutterable misery on her face, and was now upon the brink of tears. She was far beyond making any attempt to play the part of hostess, nor was it needful, for this uninvited and undesired mob, which a cruel fate had let loose upon her, were now entertaining themselves all around her with an animated and unceasing chatter which made her head feel as if it would split. Juliet, too, was now in a melancholy and rational frame of mind. She had not looked round, she had not hoped for anything, at the third arrival. She had been pointing out to herself what a simpleton she was to keep expecting to see a person who was nine miles off, and who, despite all his protestations, apparently preferred the society of partridges to her own. Then a mist came over her eyes, and Harry, whom even love could not blind at lawn-tennis, especially when the set was at stake, cried, "'I say, Juliet, what a duffer stroke!' Meanwhile a surprise was in store for her, and, indeed, for the whole party. At that instant Simmons, with his hand on the hall door, was saying, "'Not at home!' to a big, broad-shouldered young man with a sunburnt face and dark brown eyes. "'Not at home?' repeated the visitor, staggered for an instant. "'Not at home, Simmons?' he said again, with a very different intonation, slipping a small yellow coin into Simmons' hand. So it happened that, when the misery of the hostess and the merriment of her guests seemed at its height, Simmons' voice from behind announced resonantly, so as to be heard even on the tennis lawn, "'Mr. Dariumple!' Miss Audrey gave a faint cry, as of one whose powers of endurance were at last exhausted, and Juliet lost the set for herself and Harry by a wild and preposterous stroke which sent the ball not merely out of court, but far into the wood beyond. Then upon all present there fell in an instant complete silence, the silence of unutterable surprise, which kept even Mrs. Freelands dumb for some minutes at the extraordinary and unprecedented spectacle, seeing it was the height of the shooting season, of Geoffrey Dariumple at an afternoon party. "'I thought you were shooting at Enbury,' Miss Audrey was urged to murmur by a sense of intolerable wrong. 
" Oh, so I was," said Dalrymple, lightly. " We've had a very good day." He shook hands all round, entirely unconscious of the amazement he excited, as, indeed, of everything else save that Juliet was a few yards from him, and then strode off to where the players stood resting after their game. " Miss Vere," he had the assurance — at least so Harry thought it — to say, picking up a racket, " let us play the others." "We can't very well have three on one side," Harry observed bitterly, but Miss Grey, to whom a delicious clatter of china had announced the approach of tea, hastily explained that she would prefer to rest. And so they played on, a curious kind of game in which Dalrymple took all Juliet's serves as well as his own, and Harry overreached himself, and his astonished partner, too, by serves so viciously swift that they did not get over the net at all, while the tinkling of tongues and cups redoubled round the table, where Mrs. Freelands kindly dispensed the tea for Miss Audrey, after a simple method of her own, which consisted in giving essence of tea to the first five guests, and hot water to all the rest. Meantime the short day was waning. All the garden was steeped in the shadow of the woodlands, but their tree-tops glanced in crimson light and from their leafy covert one marvellous bird-voice pierced the still air with liquid music. "'Do you hear it?' asked Dalrymple of Juliet. "'Let us go closer.' And seizing this lovely pretext they went, the game being over, and were lost to view in the amber mists and amethyst shades of glades which the evening transfigured with an aureole as glamour-like and as fleeting as young love itself no i don't think miss audrey will give another party said her ladyship with almost sardonic emphasis as they drove down the drive this one has been so peculiarly successful i suppose the engagement will be officially announced directly it has been the very jolliest at home of the whole year was mrs freeland's parting speech juliet and dalrymple heartily agreed with her so did not harry as to Miss Audrey, she was in bed for a fortnight. End of Story 5 End of The Hôtel d'Angleterre and Other Stories by Lenoy Falconer